yes you yes <clears throat> good evening everyone and uh, as you all know that today we are again gathered on foxy icog web series that is chai pe charcha and that is the thought of our, our icog chairperson dr lakshmi shrikhande madam and her whole team that we will keep some very interesting topic that is clinically as well as some topics that is uh, we have to handle in day to day practice and uh, today's our topic is very interesting as we all know that i think that we all of practitioners they actually work very hard um, and we have a patients a variety of patient but sometimes very simple things but you know we have uh, get uh, all of sudden complications so theme is jab koi baat bigad jaye acha sa chal raha tha ki ekdam se hum problems mein aa gaye and for such things we have a very important Uh, topics related to that and uh, without and we have very eminent faculties dr shri uh, lakshmi shri khande madam as well as uh, uh, dr uh, uh, dr uh, dr uh, we have all uh, experts like dr bharti aapka network unstable hai ha connectivity is gone uh, koi baat nahi so uh, invite other than without doing any delay uh, dr lakshmi shri khande madam mm -hmm. and here i would like to thank uh, foxy president as well as other icogs vice presidents as well as secretaries for uh, supporting always for having such type of program so dr lakshmi shri khande madam yeah. uh, i am we all know that uh, she doesn't need any introduction that she is are not uh, icog chairperson very good academician very good uh, human being and very lovely person so madam every times we have your cv so now no, no, don't, uh, don't, don't 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 secretary general dr madhuri patel and the whole team of foxy office bearers for their constant support encouragement and guidance and i also appreciate the efforts of our vice chair dr parag biniwale secretary dr ashok kumar and convener dr bharti maheshwari for coming out month after month with interesting topics for chai pe charcha i welcome all our expert speakers we are having the experts dr mc patel we are having charmila bharti herself is moderating a very interesting panel and for expert comments we have dr manda kini me dr meena samant dr ranjana khanna dr supriya jaiswal and how can i forget the incoming national president of isopap that is dr arun maji so i welcome all the experts chairperson speakers and dear delegates As Bharti has chosen the topic, जब कोई बात बिगड़ जाए, and friends, it's really a nightmare कि सब कुछ अच्छा चल रहा है और एकदम से suddenly कोई catastrophe हो जाए. पर जब ऐसा होता है, तो हमें क्या करना चाहिए? और ऐसा ना हो, उसके लिए क्या करना चाहिए? इसीलिए आज हमने आप सबको इस चाय पे चर्चा पर बुलाया है. We all know every life counts. और जब बात बिगड़ जाए तो हमें कैसे मदर को बचाना है बच्चे को बचाना है और कैसे खुद को लिटिगेशन से बचाना है तो ये सब इम्पोर्टेंट एस्पेक्ट्स को ध्यान में रख के आज हम चाय पे चर्चा पे आप सभी को आमंत्रित करते हैं सो आई इनवाइट यू ऑल एंड भारती लेट्स स्टार्ट अवर चाय पे चर्चा फॉर टुडे आई थिंक अगेन भारती का नेटवर्क इज अनस्टेबल मैम यू हैव टू शेयर योर स्लाइड yeah i will share and i will yeah. start don't worry yes madam yeah so uh, i am the opening batsman for uh, today's chai pe charcha and i will be talking on sudden postpartum collapse as i already said it is a real nightmare let us have a look at this case you all are hardcore obstetricians so g2 heart disease previous lscs came with fully dilated cervix 60 fetal heart delivered immediately by forceps but she collapsed immediately after birth of baby cause rupture uterus simultaneous resuscitation and exploration was done and one mother saved 
This is another case, G4, P3 delivered vaginally, baby weight 3 kg, there was no tear, but there was torrential bleeding. Massage was done, uterotonics was given, anesthetist was there in the vicinity. He started resuscitation, but in spite and despite of all effort, we lost one mother. This is another case, primary with polyhydramnios, labor progressed smoothly, but mother collapsed immediately after birth of baby. And this is a real, real nightmare. Nightmare ka bhi baap. Amniotic fluid embolism. And here also, one life was lost. But after listening to all these three cases, mujhe pata hai, aap sab soch rahe hai ki ye kya bata rahi hai, Dr. Lakshmi. This will never happen to my patients. I am practicing since last 25 years. Aisa to mere practice mein kabhi hua hi nahi hai. And this is the typical mindset and attitude. But let us have a look at this tsunami. We were not prepared. It came all of a sudden. And we all know the casualties that took place during tsunami. Why tsunami? Let us have a look at the recent COVID pandemic. Where we prepared, it came all of a sudden. And we all know the casualties the toll it took place on the life and the economy of our country. Similarly, postpartum collapse, we know it is rare, but it is a potentially life-threatening condition. But silver line is that mother can be saved if managed efficiently in time. So this will never happen to my patient, should not be your attitude. Because denial is not going to help us. We have to be prepared for any catastrophe. There are many causes. I will not go into detail. There are obstetric causes. And amongst obstetric causes, we know that hemorrhage is the major cause of this maternal collapse in labor ward after birth. We all say obstetrics is bloody business. Therefore, fourth stage of labor, we must teach to our resident doctors in public sector, in private sector, because after the birth of the baby, mother is shifted to the ward. Everybody is focused on the baby. Nobody looks after the mother. And this has actually happened in a medical college that mother was found dead after two hours of delivery when and her bed was completely soaked with the blood. So fourth stage of labor, we have to teach everyone and we also have to be alert. Then there are non-obstetric causes for sudden postpartum collapse. Whatever may be the cause, the thumb rule as far as sudden postpartum collapse is concerned is you have to immediately start resuscitation and then start searching for the probable cause which is responsible for the situation. Because once CPR is started immediately, then only this mother has the best chance of survival as brain damage starts in four to six minutes of time and it is certain after 10 minutes without CPR. The first and foremost prerequisite of this is don't allow yourself to be collapsed. And you collapse, so that should not happen. Do not lose confidence and do not panic or become emotional or start uh, feeling guilty or self-blame game should not start. Your confidence and presence of mind will determine the outcome for this particular woman. Don't waste precious time in starting the resuscitation and baat bigardi nahi chahiye iske liye bhi aur baat bigard jaye iske liye bhi always your labor and OT, uh, your labor room and OT should always be ready to deal with any kind of crisis. So this is the ABC of resuscitation. But before ABC, you have to learn to call for help. Like if you are in a public hospital or you are in your own, uh, own nursing home, tell one sister, we all have intercoms in our hospital. She can call the receiver, she can press the intercom button. And receptionists can start calling your anesthetists, your assistants, your other colleagues, and they all can come to the uh, situation to help you. Then comes A, that is airway. You have to check for the 
airway. Prompt and effective airway management is critical to successful resuscitation. Efforts are directed at early intubation of the trachea as it protects from aspiration of stomach contents and facilitates effective ventilation of the mother. I remember during our MBBS days, we used to have posting in anesthesia department and there we were taught how to intubate. Of course, we all lose that uh, because we are not practicing it day in and day out, but we all should know how to intubate in cases of emergency. In obstetric patients, intubation is really difficult. Again, as was, I was saying, the proposed factors includes our reduction in training expertise due to increasing use of regional techniques, that is regional anesthesia and situational stress. That is why also sometimes we fail. Again, in these cases, the presence of large breast, sometimes obesity, edema of the soft tissues, they may also further complicate the situation as far as airway management is concerned. But we all should have a well-organized trolley every time in your our premises ready. Gum elastic bogies, alternate laryngoscopes, laryngeal mask and advanced fiber optic devices may improve success, but you should not delay ventilation by other means. And in a cannot intubate, cannot ventilate situation, emergency cricothyroidotomy uh, may be required. Once you are taken care of A, you have to come to B, that is breathing. Breathing. If it is too large and forceful, remember it increases intrathoracic pressure in the lungs. Thus, there will be a decreased venous return to the heart. So, forceful breath should not be given. If the patient is breathing and conscious, then immediately you have to look for the life-threatening conditions such as severe pulmonary edema and pneumothorax. Again, we have to use our MBBS days training here because inspection you have to do of the chest, whether this is an abdominal breathing, whether patient is using accessory muscles for the breathing, whether there is any cyanosis. Of course, after inspection, we all have been taught percussion and auscultation and not after COVID, each and everyone is having pulse oximetry ready by your bedside to take help of that pulse oximetry and see the amount of oxygen present in the blood. But if she is breathing, but on unconscious, then according to current ILR protocol, CPR <coughs> should be considered. And you don't, should not mistake agonal breathing for normal. Agonal breathing is a series of noisy gas occurring in around 40% of cardiac arrest victims. So after A and B, now comes the C. The original meaning of the C is to assess the presence or absence of circulation, usually by taking a carotid pulse before taking any other steps. If circulation is present, continue rescue breathing, check circulation every minute. If no circulation, then you have to start CPR, compress chest at the rate of 100 per minute and 30 is to 2 ratio for compression is to breath. Correct technique of CPR should be taught to each one in your hospital, starting from doctors to paramedical workers to your class three and class four workers. Everyone should know the basic steps of CPR and how to give correct CPR in cases of emergency. So these are the steps of CPR. And according to new emergency care guidelines, emphasis is given more on the chest compression. Now there are variations to the, this uh, ABC. Sometimes a D is added, sometimes DR is added. So this D stands for danger and R stands for response. Sometimes this D also stands for defibrillation Decision, whether defibrillation is required or not, and D also stands for differential diagnosis. So ABC is primary, you can have ABCD or you can have ABCDR. Even with successful CPR, 
most victims they won't survive without advanced cardiac life support system and this includes defibrillation we have noticed that defibrillator is there everywhere at the airports and in malls but do we really know how to operate this aed we all should know these are the four basic steps of operating aed now at some place you have to decide and take a decision for transport if this advanced life support system is not arriving on the scene most local protocols they advise transporting the patient when one of the following occurs that is patient has regained a pulse six to nine shocks have been delivered without return of spontaneous circulation the aed gives three consecutive messages that no shock is advised and your local protocol always takes precedence over this general guideline in the event that resuscitation is unsuccessful a decision will need to be made by the team to discontinue cpr given the distressing nature of failed resuscitation adequate counseling and debriefing we always forget the counseling and debriefing of the whole team who were giving resuscitation to this particular uh, patient it should be placed and it should be done now ye to ho gaya jab baat bigad jaye par baat bigde nahi aur agar bigad jaye to hame kya precautions lena chahiye friends of course we all say prevention is better than cure so this is the list that you all have to be prepared you all have to have a emergency drug tray ready you should have enough stock of all the pitocin methagen carboprost sometimes laryngoscope is there but uh, cells are missing torch is there but again cells are missing suction machine kaam nahi kar rahi hai laparotomy drum ko sister autoclave karna bhul gayi hai we have to check for oxygen supply cylinder hai par opener nahi mil raha hai sister idhar udhar bhag rahi hai opener lane ke liye patient ke sam patient ke relatives ke samne so ye sab cheeze nahi honi chahiye and for this we all should have regular emergency drills in the labor room these are the contents what should be there in the emergency drug tray now if there is any catastrophe what are the outcomes these are the four outcomes mother recovers completely we all are happy mother dies very sad outcome don't forget to inform police and insist for post mortem without post mortem you should not hand over the body dr mc patel will tell you in detail mother becomes brain damaged and the fourth outcome is family takes legal action against hospital obstetrician and anesthetist so for fourth outcome documentation documentation and documentation you all should enter the event the details of the cpr given and what was the outcome of that cpr it should be clear documented in your case reports friends no matter where and how a woman delivers giving birth should be a moment of joy and not a sentence of death because motherhood is a dream of every woman and with teamwork we can make it a reality friends after the ship is sunk Everybody knows how it could have been saved, but फायदा नहीं है क्योंकि ship तो already डूब चुकी है अब सब अपने opinion दे रहे हैं. So same is here in cases of emergencies. Once it has occurred, you all have to be prepared. So your intelligent anticipation, skilled supervision, prompt detection, effective institution of therapy can prevent. disastrous consequences and you can have a good outcome so again i am coming back to my first slide that this will never happen to my patient should not be your attitude because denial is not going to help you you have to be prepared for any catastrophe preparation hone ke baad bhi agar baat bigad hi jaye so you have to act fast real fast within 2 minutes you should be able to do all these steps of a b c if you want to have a good outcome that fast you all have to be friend this is a very uh, good video
मिला दो हाथों की ये उंगलिया बीच सीने के रखो हथेलिया मिला दो हाथों की ये उंगलिया बीच सीने के रखो हथेलिया दबा उसी नजूर से बार बार के देखो सीना ऊपर आए हर बार जीवन संजीवनी दो दो इंच सीने को दबाना है दोनों हाथ तुमको सीधे रखना है दो इंच सीने को दबाना है दोनों हाथ तुमको सीधे रखना है जो थक जाओ तो दूजे को बुलाना है किसर के पीछे जो को आके रखना है धड़कने जगानी है तो मत करो फिजूल यारे इंतजार जीवन संजीवनी दो जीवन संजीवनी दोया जीवन संजीवनी दोया सो दिस वाज द सॉन्ग आई वांटेड एवरीवन टू लिसन टू बिकॉज इट इज एक्सप्लेन्ड इन अ वेरी वेरी सिंपल वे व्हाट शुड बी द बेसिक स्टेप्स ऑफ सीपीआर फॉर ऑल मेडिकोस एज वेल एज नॉन मेडिकोस सो फ्रेंड्स फॉर दिस टाइप ऑफ चर्चा द मैसेज फ्रॉम माय टॉक इज दैट you have to be prepared for any catastrophe and if after preparation if something happens you have to act fast and real fast thank you so much for your patient hearing thank you madam uh, excellent talk in very less time you have uh, uh, tell every told everything and that is really a uh, uh, very good message and i think that uh, we all must learn that all of sudden when we are not ready and some thing uh, complications occurs ya kuch baat bigad jaye to without getting panic how we have to handle the things so now um, as madam said that today is the foxy icog web series uh, many of us have joined so i just wanted to tell you that about uh, uh, madam that who uh, we all know that madam dr lakshmi shrikhande has delivered excellent talk on this postpartum care uh, on the postpartum collapse and she is a chief person icog uh, many students have joined madam and they wanted to yeah. know you that i am introducing you officially she is a national corresponding editor general of obgy by india shogi national corresponding uh, secretary uh, association of medical science founder patron and president isopap vidarbha chapter 2019 and 21 and uh, uh, that is really good things and i have some uh, madam has invited me in some uh, her webinar also anchia person ims education committee 2021 to 23 she is the president association of medical women nagpur many awards and many publications uh, in madam credits so thank you very much madam for organizing this event and giving a wonderful talk so now we comes to the today's topic and that is about sir uh, uh, jab koi baat bigad jaye during obstetrics uh, means some related to uh, procedure uh, during procedures when we have hemorrhage so we have with the uh, experts with us dr mandakini meek madam uh, madam you are here hello i think as madam will come she will join so we all know dr mandakini madam is a past icog chair person then we have uh, with us uh, professor arup kumar masi he is a professor and head rg car medical college kolkata and he is a president elect isopa we all know her then dr him dr ranjana khanna madam is a national vice president fox in 2017 founder president priyaraj chapter of isopa when we all know she is so loving and um, Uh, academic person then come to dr meena saman so she was the past secretary of isopa president patna ops and gynae society past and she is also uh, remained the chairperson foxy clinical research committee very academic person 
and then uh, we come to the dr supriya jaiswal the vice president patna of sankhya ne society chairperson at with an adolescent health committee foxy so uh, on the whole we have a very uh, good uh, esteemed panelist and uh, we have a uh, lots of experience and the thing is so now we come to the topic and we have around uh, for, uh, it is a 4:30 we have around 45 or 50 minutes to complete this uh, session so we know jab koi baat bigad jaye sudden obstetrical complication and this is the situation when though we say that don't get panic but we know how we feel all of sudden we have a lots of things in our mind we have a emergency use emergency contact we get panic but in the end if we use all skills we use all strategies then finally everything goes well so this is the a uh, theme or this is the goal of uh, today's discussion so obstetric uh, this is the mainly focused on the bleeding when we are doing any procedures like mtp or uh, or the evacuation or during cesarean so we all know ki still obstetric hemorrhage it still remains a major cause of maternal death in developed and developing world and still scary world we all uh, are afraid of that uh, even when we are doing any procedure somewhere in our mind about the hemorrhage and this hemorrhage includes uh, whatever i am going to talk that is hemorrhage during pregnancy childbirth or in a postpartum or more focus need and uh, nowadays the hemorrhage of course we all know about the pph there is evidence of some standard care in all death due to obstetric hemorrhage the prevention and treatment the prevention and treatment these are only and only vital steps towards improving the healthcare of women during childbirth so other aspects of the postpartum hemorrhage as well as medical legal is always be covered in the next lecture so i am uh, focusing mainly in the hemorrhage that is go, uh, going to have, have uh, happens in during procedure antenatal so uh, dr arup kumar maji is with us so sir we i just want to ask that can we anticipate such type of hemorrhage uh, or all cases are equally prone और यस देन हाउ वी कैन एंटिसिपेट एंड अगर हमें लगता है कि हाँ ये पेशेंट बहुत हाई रिस्क है या कम थोड़ा हाई रिस्क है तो वॉट काउंसलिंग एक्चुअली वी शुड डू एंड वॉट प्रिपरेशन हैज टू डू एक बेसिक जो हर पेशेंट में हमें करके रखना चाहिए डॉक्टर माझी सर आई एम गोइंग टू द आंसर दर ओनली हेमरी जो कर हाई रिस्क केसेस Uh, definitely there is hemorrhage occurs more in the high risk cases will be prepared for that but every obstetric patient is at high risk if you take us on statistics you will see the maternal death uh, regarding the maternal death uh, there are uh, 80 to 85% cases are low risk and 15% the high risk but majority of the deaths occur in case of low risk cases because high risk cases we are prepared so every case every case prone to develop hemorrhage during pregnancy even there is a no risk factor but there are some risk factors definitely particularly i'm going to the uh, postpartum hemorrhage where there is a more chance of pph risk factors like if uh, there is a history of antepartum hemorrhage and particularly if the patient there is a polyhypnan as Uh, multiple uh, pregnancy previous history of antepartum hemorrhage obesity uh, prolonged labor uh, precipitate labor and these cases are more more to develop uh, the postpartum hemorrhage more and particularly those patients who are uh, the anemia anemic mother even the is less blood they make cause the postpartum hemorrhage so we must counsel the we must kind of counsel all the uh, mothers irrespective of the risk cases and risk cases will go uh, will uh, counsel more high risk cases and and other things is that there may be some uh, history like the uh, there may be the pre existing bleeding disorder antico history of anticoagulant these are actually uh, less there are the less chance and during uh, delivery there are Uh, some chances are already focused uh, <laughs> dr varthi there is the instrumental delivery particularly the undilated cervix there is a more chance of uh, postpartum hemorrhage and there is a, if there is a retinal placenta there is a more chance of uh, hemorrhage 
and precipitated liver and uh, uh, prolonged liver I have al already uh, said. So we must have to counsel the patient, we must have to prepare. If they must have to prepare for that. First, Dr. Luxia said that preparation should start in the uh, labor room, particularly during delivery. That is the, the best is the Laksa procedure, which has, uh, government has instituted. The labor room will be well equipped with the everything. And oxygen, monitor, uh, IV set, and the fluid, and drug, particularly the eutrotonics drug, into normal temp uh, and temperature, tanexamic acids, and the intubation set, and with the, with the personnel that must be prepared. And during uh, postpartum hemorrhage, PPH, if there is a PPH to, free, to death from the PPH, I am mainly focusing on the postpartum hemorrhage. Typically, how will you prevent? Number one is the active management of the third stage of liver. That is reduced, dramatically reduced the death. And second one is the management, those are there is a chance of postpartum memory, uh, manage very early stage. You look up, look, uh, look uh, that patient, the Luxia said the fourth stage of labor is very important, very, very important. After the delivery of the baby, the news goes to the patient party and the boy baby. So there is a sweet seeds, etc. Not like that. The fourth stage is actually very important and that should be that patient should be kept in the lower room, not in the ward. In the observation ward, definitely, but not in the observed ward. The patient, at least 15 minutes, you'll have to see, particularly the pulse, BP, uterine contraction, and also there is, a, there is a blood in PP. So that is the fourth stage management is the very uh, important. And regarding the <coughs> prevention, if you say, want to know about the active management of the third stage of liver, WHO and FIGO, 2022 is the it is the eutrotonic drug single one is the eutrotonic drugs eutrotonic drug and eutrotonic drug and other the uh, components of the active management first stage of liver that is the uterine massaging is not done just to keep your hand on the uterus whether there is the atonicity or not because atonicity and then 80 percent cases the PPH which is caused by the atonicity and third is the control contraction yes control contraction is advocated by the WHO and WHO also, but it should be done only by the skilled birth attendant. If there is no skilled birth attendant, particularly that will uh, again uh, do the uh, uh, turn of the call. So that is, and uh, previous, yes, yeah, the early count company, no role, only the late count, count company is that done. So this is four, or the four, only three are the active management of the third stage of Now. Come to the active management of third stage about the drug. Drug, there is a clear tight guideline by the WHO and which drug you will use. The first drug, commonest drug, and the choice of drug is nothing but the oxytocin. But that oxytocin should be of the qualitative, the good quality, and the maintenance of the particular, the cold chain maintenance of the oxytocin is very important because the oxytocin, the now, many patients, uh, they are suffer from the PPH and also sometimes the reaction of the oxytocin because only the, the oxytocin is not properly maintained. It is, should be maintained 2 to 8 degree and also the transport is also there. Transport is important. So oxytocin should be delivered, it should be taken from the fridge uh, only few minutes ago and you make it the room temperature, then you use oxytocin 10 units. Uh, IM is usually given, IW, according to WHO, IV can also be uh, given, but if IV is given, very, very slowly you will have to go, both in CRN section and, uh, and normal delivery, vaginal delivery. And CRN section, usually IV is preferred because the patient is under control of the anesthetic, there will be no problem. So this is regarding the oxytocin. If, if you have any doubt about the oxytocin, about the quality of the oxytocin, the second drug, the other drugs are in the misoprostol, particularly in the rural area. Orally can be given 600, 600 microgram misoprostol tablet. Is a, no problem of the preservation is like that. That is important. Advantages can, can be given in the uh, uh, rural area. And third drug that is important drug is a methodology, uh, argumentary. That is the point two milligram 
uh, IM or IV can be given, but it is contraindicated. All of you know, in all cases it cannot be given, particularly if there is a hypertension, heart disease, it, it should not be uh, given. The third drug. And fourth drug is the combination drug of the oxygen uh, of the methargin and the oxytocin. Methargin and the oxytocin is the fixed dose drug. Methargin uh, is the uh, oxytocin is the uh, five units and uh, methargin is the 500 microgram. Uh, is common IM is usually given. And the newer drug, the carbidocin. Carbidocin is the drug which is uh, used only for the uh, preventive measure that is active management of the uh, liver and not yet established or recommended uh, for the management of the PPH oxytocin 100 is given slowly IV or I it is, it is the given the uh, uh, advantage of the uh, carbidocin is that it is a quick acting quick acting drug and is the half life is long that is the in, compared to oxytocin it is the uh, uh, half life is four to five minutes, but in case of uh, carbidocin, half life is uh, 40 minutes. That about the carbidocin. And is more strong action, stronger action than the oxytocin, is equal action of the methargin. So, advantage of the methargin and advantage of the oxygen and mixed with the carbidocin. carbidocin. And some preparation of the carbidocin is, uh, can be kept in the room temperature. That is the uh, 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 the one advantage that is the lower uh, transport expenses, tra transport expenses. Rate. But regarding methargin, I am saying one thing that is very important to know. We say always that methargin can be methargin can be kept in the room temperature, but it is not uh, truly uh, hundred percent correct. But methargin, you as far as possible, you would keep it in the cold. But it can be even in the rural area, can be room temperature. But how many days or months you will uh, you will keep keep, keep in the uh, room temperature that is guided by the manufacturer. And usually, sometimes usually five to six months some manufacturer and is like this. And so in should be kept away. They should be kept away from the kept away always from the sunlight from the to the sun. Uh, regarding other drugs, that is the. Uh, 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 prostaglandin, prostaglandin F2 alpha, it is not used for the active management of the liver. It is given in case of established postpartum menopause. So I am only telling about the prevent oxytocin use for the prevention of the man, uh, the postpartum MRI, the third stage. All are given after the delivery. Uh, the methadone is given after the delivery of the placenta definitely. Or oxytocin is given after the delivery of the baby. So anything, any other questions? Uh, doctor, <laughs> any other questions? Yeah, I will highlight the management, uh, the postpartum. I think there are many. Yeah, it was good to listen you. You are a new teacher and we all were listening to you, whatever you were telling. So you have told a very important issue. Definitely that will come in this panel also. But you have declared, uh, you have told that what you told only that we should keep in our hand. So here, uh, what the um, next uh, situation is, we have some situation in discussion. So Dr. Rajna, Madam, that of course, Dr. Uh, Arup sir has told. And we all know that uh, every woman Woman is prone for complications. किसी भी woman में सब कुछ normal है और आप एकदम से बात भी कर जाए और ये हम लोग के साथ तो बहुत ज़्यादा है हम obstetricians के साथ. So again, uh, this is very important that how you predict the things in earlier. क्योंकि आजकल हम लोग के पास ultrasound है हमारे पास अपने clinical skills हैं. So we must have uh, the use in every patient because you don't know कि in which patients you have some complication. Here they are the uh, really um, case uh, actually we have faced in our college in around uh, 10 uh, 20 days back that the one woman she came that is a early pregnancy but she was uh, at that time she was bleeding it was sort of uh, incomplete abortion so that uh, some prior investigation was not done and she was on board and she was having the uh, scar 
and then uh, actually uh, when she was started the evacuation she all of sudden uh, she started the pouring uh, and she was having the bleeding and then uh, in the uh, during management all things are managed and finally she was found that she was ascarectopic so dr rena is some method that we can predict or we can suspect as ascarectopic or we can have confirmed diagnosis of ascarectopic in advance and yes. if yes yeah, then what we should do yeah yeah actually if the patient comes with a history of previous cesarean then it is mandatory that we should keep in mind uh, the possibility of a scar ectopic and for that it is essential that we get a tvs done a doppler and there are certain guidelines green top guidelines uh, in 2021 by the rcog they say that uh, to be sure that it is ectopic and not uh, scar ectopic and not maybe a cervical uh, pregnancy or a normal intrauterine pregnancy the empty uterine cavity should be seen gestational sac or a mass of trophoblastic cells will be seen near the internal os thin or absent layer of myometrium is seen between the bladder and the gestational sac and uh, color doppler will show lot of uh, vasculature there and plus pre presence of empty endo cervical canal so when we have a suspicion of uh, scar ectopic it makes things much easier and we will do the beta hcg and we find see there are two types of scar ectopics one is the one which grows towards the uterine cavity and uh, then it is not very risky and sometimes they can even go to term of course the risk of placenta accreta is there in these cases but the other type of scar ectopic will grow inwards it will go towards the muscle musculature and go towards the bladder so these are the scar ectopics which are very dangerous and they can lead to heavy bleeding so first we have to determine and when we are clear that it is scar ectopic then uh, if the beta hcg levels are less than 5000 we can go in for medical management medical management i think oh, everybody is very familiar it is injection methotrexate either we can give it a single dose or we can give 1 mg per kg body weight uh, on day 1 3 5 and 7 and in between we give folinic acid 0.1 mg per kg body weight so this is a very good method and if the patient is stable then we can definitely go in for medical uh, treatment but provided as i said that the beta hcg levels should be less than 5000 and otherwise there are many who think that the best is the definitely the surgical treatment then for surgical treatment of course some prefer the laparoscopic some prefer laparoscopic and hysteroscopic approach because if the uh, uh, millimeter the thickness between the bladder and the gestational sac is very thin it is safer to have a laparoscope inside also so that the bladder can be separated and then we can operate with the hysteroscope guide it from inside so this is best otherwise you can do a open laparotomy and uh, just scoop out that area and then we can resuture it properly this time and uh, if the patient is bleeding you can have a balloon uh, tamponade put inside to stop the bleeding or we can have do uterine artery uh, uh, embolization that will also control the bleeding but in this patient where that you were talking about she came with heavy bleeding so in heavy bleeding first you have to be sure that what is the amount of blood loss whether uh, we should proceed further or we should withdraw our instruments and then immediately go in for the resuscitative measures once the patient gets resuscitated then uh, we have to look and diagnose and if we are sure it's scar ectopic then accordingly then we can go in for uterine artery embolization that will immediately control the bleeding you can put in a balloon tamponade that will help control give tranexamic acid and uh, once it is controlled uh, operative in and in many cases if the patient is bleeding heavily we may even need a hysterectomy uh, because ultimately saving the life of the patient is the one thing that is most important in these cases so we have to be very sure what we are treating and uh, in these cases uh, even if we do a evacuation a curettage then we will uh, just do a hysteroscopic guided 
so that we are sure that we are seeing what we are doing it's not a blind procedure because otherwise uh, an evacuation is a blind procedure and with the uh, common scanula we can end up damaging also so we have to be very sure and if it is uh, then we can also do a surgical evacuation so depends uh, on the condition of the patient if she is of course uh, torrential bleeding for first we'll have to transfuse blood see her stats uh, if her vital statistics are very low then we have to manage accordingly so um, yeah. i think important. we have to be bus very careful in previous cesarean please get an ultrasound done before you put your instruments inside because that is of utmost importance so madam very beautifully you have told the management of such type of patient but again had this patient come in emergency and she has not gone uh, any care uh, before that so that was a different situation but yeah must always uh, as you have said that whenever you are doing any procedure on the any scar duter so that is a must that you must uh, check for the uh, scar ectopic and definitely uh, sonography and other clinically if by history you can find out some high risk factors like that is a recurrence is more common in patient undergoing surgical compared with non surgical management as well as mm. it is said that any woman is having any scar like even she has multiple dncs and no exactly they mm. can also have and they are having the history of manual removal of placenta and procedures like ivf etc so they have also and besides that um, uh, diagnosis is very uh, can be made very easily by transvaginal ultrasonography yes yeah here it is the important thing that pregnancy implanted or in a prior hysterectomy scar they are confirmed at the time of surgery with histologic confirmation like in such case and that is it is found during procedure and then only can be confirmed by histologically and preferred modality transvaginal sonography and this is very uh, good slide where you can say that you can found all of you, we us we must have habit to see the location of placenta when women and then it is less than 7 week if low anterior position location of gestation sac if it is low anterior position of gestation sac at less than 7 week a low anterior yes. position that is an ultrasound marker for crp at very early gestational age if we can if we miss that thing then we can have trouble later on second thing after 7 to 9 weeks of gestation the gestation sac pushes into uterine cavity as you have told and leaving behind them plantar placenta and this is the only available place for the sac to expand into agar pregnancy aage badhegi to then it could be uh. to uterine cavity second important thing is that low lying anterior placenta or placenta pvia placenta lacune they are the features of adherent pregnancy beside that thin less than 3 mm no intervening margin yes. clear space between placenta and bladder and the uterine serosa irregular or dis uh, irregular and disrupted bladder line or anterior bulging sac into the bladder increased vascularity That's at the bladder and placenta interface then these findings are present then definitely you must have suspicion and uh, you must taken care of whenever you are doing the procedure and one thing i just wanted to tell you that when cervical you pregnancy out, yes yeah, there is a important deficient diagnosis in cervical pregnancy yes. but again if woman is not having any scar then you can think that you have to confirm again it is rare form of ectopic pregnancy and can be differentiated from csp by gestation sac or placenta within the survey contiguous and unlike CS csp cervical pregnancy almost almost always occur in patient without history of prior cesarean yes. and if sometimes women come with early pregnancy loss and you see the uh, products or gestation sac in the lower segment and you think whether it is scar ectopic or not so in such cases again in the one sometimes in one ultrasound you can't detect so in patient uh, in the subsequent ultrasound uh, you can detect and vestigial cardiac activity is usually absent in such cases How and you have, have to be sure that the cervical canal is empty then that is the best way to uh, differentiate yes yes, yes. and in try sometime while in intra uterine pregnancy and usually low implantation of gestational sac may raise suspicion of csp so can essentially be ruled out in patient without a history of previous cesarean mm -hmm. management you have all told that the, we can have like hemodynamically unstable mm -hmm. patient then definitely we have to immediately surgical intervention and either we can have lots of procedures as you have tell if we can do and uh, then wedge dissection or gravid hysterectomy sometimes required and especially if there is a embryonic demise is there then potassium chloride or misoprostol they are usually sometimes used and patient can have sometimes can choose expected management but again in such cases by serum beta hcg you have to follow the cases 
and patient with incomplete resolution like if you are seeing that is not uh, uh, scg is not decreasing then you have to hidden the resolution by treatment with systemic methotrexate or uterine aspiration what you have told ultrasound guided uterine aspiration we have done in our our scenarios many times because sometimes uh, many, nowadays histoscope is of course very accessible but sometimes it is not there so we all obstetricians should know that who, who are the high risk for the uh, scar ectopic one thing so without doing ultrasound without ruling out the scar ectopic we should not we should preferably not do uh, procedures and if because if uh, if we can diagnose it earlier then we can prepare it well or we can refer it where it can be managed well and uh, expectant management with a live gestation associated with severe maternal morbidity hemorrhage early uterine rupture hysterectomy uh, what it is uh, said in some researches but some patient will deliver a live born unit at or near term some patient may choose to continue the pregnancy however expert group including the society of maternal fetal medicine they don't uh, recommend that these pregnancies should be continued okay. besides huh? beside that the risk increases morbidity morbidity all increases with increasing gestational age surgical treatment of second trimester csp has a higher success rate than medical treatment so if you women is sometime diagnosed in the second trimester so definitely you have to do surgical treatment and in future pregnancy if it is not required and a patient who prefer definitive surgical treatment so sometimes gravid hysterectomy may be done and operative uh, resections you have already told that it is hysteroscopy guided or by laparoscopy or even by laparotomy laparoscopic assisted operative hysteroscopic management they can be done and one advantage of resection over other therapy is that the scar can be excised and uterus is reapproximated operative resection is also likely to be curative however monitoring serum scg weekly until undetectable it is reasonable to confirm resolution so such type of patient the uh, counseling is also very important and suction aspiration is typically performed for patient in early first trimester with use of trans cervical balloon catheter if heavy bleeding occur gravid is that me in whom future high gel bending is not desired with life threatening hemorrhage and may be the preferred approach of patient with second trimester medical therapy such as already told that what um, methotrexate kcl balloon catheter we all know adjuvant therapy uae can be used along in combination with other therapies systemic methotrexate can be also used subsequent pregnancies following csp have been reported that patients are at risk for recurrent scar implantation abnormal presentation and uterine rupture so these such things had be be given uh, keep in mind and they should be given in their the star slip and patient should be counseled that next pregnancy is high risk role of ultrasound for screening pregnant women with a previous caesarean birth and other high risk women like history of previous uh, csp may benefit from early ultrasound screening in subsequent pregnancy so awareness should be increased that we have to uh, do early uh, at the seven weeks the location of gestation sac and the position of gestation sac so this was about the uh, women choose having the scar and having the scar ectopic they like, have chances now we come to the sudden second situation where uh, this is a very common situation where again जब कोई बात बिगड़ जाए अचानक बीच में कुछ ऐसा हो सकता है द केस इज लाइक अ वोमेन विद रेटो वर्टेड यूट्रस वी आर डूइंग अवेक्शन प्रोसीजर ड्यूरिंग विच यू नोट दैट द इंस्ट्रूमेंट पास रिलेटिव फर्दर देन एक्सपेक्टेड however you presume this is due to shape of her uterus as she is recovering her heart rate become rapid and her blood pressure begins to fall you also notice that the bleeding per vaginam is more than expected so what is your provisional diagnosis and how you will manage so basically this is a sudden hemorrhage during evacuation management so dr meena madam uh, will you like to uh, highlight such this case and their management yeah thank you dr hartik Yeah, all all of us were working in labor rooms and doing a lot of the kind of these um, abortion cases, MTPs, DNAs, and DNCs. Uh, we must we all have encountered such cases. And like one of my teachers used to say, those who are not doing, they would not find. But those who are regularly working in such cases, definitely they are seeing such cases. So I think it's not a very uncommon situation. Maybe fine, but it is something very undesirable. So, like here is a situation uh, where she is eight weeks, and we are going in for evacuation procedure. Uterus, as you have already said, is retroverted. Let me tell you, whenever we are doing such a procedure, which is a blind procedure, and it is by practice and regular, you know, the assessment, the size, and all, we get into the habit of what's right and what's not so right. So. 
a situation where the uterus is retroverted, we know it's not the, the axis is not straight, there is a possibility that you may just, so that's why whenever we are starting with such a procedure, we need to straighten the track, hold, catch hold of the cervix and try to make it a little straight and try to assess the size. Before can you take such any such procedure, uh, do a PV examination after evacuation of the uh, bladder and then see. So now, like you already mentioned that she is now bleeding, probably perforated, and she is having some internal bleeding. And now you also, because that's why her heart rate has increased, her blood pressure is beginning to fall. And also not only the internal bleed, there's possibility that uh, the vagina, the external obvious bleeding is also there. So now we have two, there are three problems at hand. One is that we've probably injured the uterus or maybe some other organ inside the uh, abdominal cavity which needs to be repaired. Or we have a situation where the patient is bleeding and we have to take care of our vitals. And also the products of conception are there, probably we've not completed the procedure. So we have to manage at least these three, maybe some more other conditions uh, may be have to tackle. So uh, first things first, like her, uh, her vitals are falling, her BP is falling down, her heart rate is becoming rapid, we need to resuscitate. So we are in the OT doing this procedure, we need to inform our uh, anesthetist that maybe we have uh, some complication at hand and they may have to Please the anesthesia. Uh, the, uh, so they have to be well informed. We have to inform our nurse uh, that this is at hand. They will have to put IV, maybe a higher, wider board IV cannula in both the hands because we have to resuscitate her, put her on oxygen if she's not on oxygen. And we need to inform our team because we need a lot of people to help us here. Uh, and if it's a junior kind of a person, we have to, they have to inform their senior or the consultants. And even if it's a consultant, they have to uh, take care that the team is complete. So there will be somebody looking at the IV line, somebody looking at the blood for cross match. They will, this patient probably needs blood looking by the, the condition you just described. And we have to get the dryser because uh, we will know uh, whether she's going into shock, what is the uh, output? Because that is very. Uh, then, of course, like I said, blood, blood products, they have to be made available, and then we have to start the resuscitation by giving uh, IV products, which would be crystalloids at the outset. Now, uh, the thing is, now she is bleeding, definitely, and we always we have a high risk where the uterus is retroverted and the health. We have already suspected that the sound has gone a little higher. Then we also have to know what was the instrument that we have using, or whether we used just one shoulder inside or just evaluated the suction, if there's any other tissue apart from the products of conception, which are the so there we can, you know, there are depending on what it is. Like if she was stable, probably my I my uh, this thing would be to do. Maybe stop the procedure, give her antibiotics, uh, uh, watch her uh, vitals, and maybe later do an ultrasound and see. But now, because her vitals are falling, we know there is some active bleeding inside, and now maybe it is time to put in a lab scope so, uh, to see the state of affairs inside her abdominal cavity. So, I think that is what my next uh, step would be. Uh, and also because it's going to help me complete the process of evacuation. So once the laparoscope is inside, uh, we have to, depending on what we find there, is there a, a hemoperitoneum inside, what is the size of the injury, what is the site of the injury, whether, whether it is at the fundus, which is easy to repair, whether, whether it is in the lateral walls, where there may be torrential hemorrhage, both inside and out, because we know that the uterines are coming from the uh, lateral side of the uterus. Or if we've gone, uh, I mean, uh, if it's uh, anywhere in uh, any bowel loops, if they were adherent or future, then again. So if we have the facility of having the laparoscope there and then that is something, uh, you know, uh, something ideal or maybe uh, desirable. 
But otherwise, if patient is in shock and we do not have the um, expertise or uh, instrument ready at that time, we should go ahead, go for a laparotomy. There is no doubt about it because uh, there is a bleeding inside, patient is not ready. So, giving antibiotics, take a laparotomy if needed, and depending on what it is, we may. I mean, like if we have put in a laparoscope, we can just complete the process of evacuation that time also, just uh, seeing that uh, we are not injuring, creating any greater injury at the time. Then if, uh, like if we have, I mean, we are supposing, you know, sometimes it does happen. So it's a blind procedure and our suction machine, we put in a suction and we've injured any of the organs, we have to maybe take help of the surgeons. Uh, not feel shy because it's a team effort that is going to help our patient. And if the bowel needs repairing, that has to be done. We have to do a bit of toileting, put in drains, repair, complete the procedure. So uh, this is uh, in short nutshell uh, regarding what happens when such a thing happens. Not to feel scared because these are non own complications and we have to be ready for that. Another thing like you already covered up in the last cases, just as we are putting in our, what happens sometimes, we put in our dilator and the patient starts pouring. And especially it happens uh, when uh, it's an old thing and there may be some coagulation, it's an old uh, miscarriage and uh, there may be some uh, vascular injury and it starts pouring that time. We have to take some. But then this is it's a clear case of uh, perforation. That's how I would like to Dr. Meena, yeah, you have told very clearly about all things diagnosis and management. So we must keep in mind whenever you are doing because the uh, complications of evacuation is shock, secondary hemorrhage, infection, and uh, that is the continuation of pregnancy. That was definitely there. But hemorrhage uh, perforation, so we must be clear that if our instrument is going on the long, uh, long delay or what is the uh, high risk in the cases where the like extremely retroverted uterus or there is some soft uterus or um, uh, like um, uh, such cases in we will have um, more chances of perforation and that's why in such way uh, MBA uh, manual vacuum aspiration and their carmen cannulas they are the good device till 12 weeks if one is doing the evacuation then uh, it can causes less perforation and uh, but that is true that once if you feel one must be aware of that and it's very important then at what gestation is and who is doing in trimester abortion they are always have a higher risk of complication so it should be done at the proper place where all facilities for the emergency management as well as for the ot is available and the basic things like immediately stop the position and do the tendon back position and then if operation is small like by the cannula dilator less than eight millimeter then even you can complete the procedure immediately under ultrasound or laparoscopic guidance and uh, if she is unstable as you have said then she have to uh, do the uh, laparotomy or uh, um, you have to open the abdomen and then you have to manage accordingly and uh, but one must know okay, what are the signs and symptoms of the perforation and how basic uh, fluid management oxygenation IV antibiotic they all are things and sign of surgical emergencies one must identify like if woman is having this procedures and you say that is a very common condition when patient comes to the labor room that even sometimes they don't tell that some procedure is done this is just just keep it with that or bleeding or and you find out you find out the abdomen yeah you find out some peritonitis and then low blood pressure patient is sometime in septic shock and then you find out the uh, uh, ultrasound or x-ray and found that is the features of perforation so that is the thing so this is a very uh, and, and of course many senior doctors they are sometimes doing and they uh, it comes a bleeding shuru and perforation ho gaya to sometimes they feel very guilt ki oh ye uh, is the 
प्रोसीजर आ रही है हमसे हो गया और जो ओ का स्टाफ और बहुत सारी बातें होने लगती है बाहर तक सीजन आती है बट वी ऑल मस्ट अंडरस्टैंड दैट इज अ ब्लाइंड प्रोसीजर कैन अकर बट ऑफ कोर्स मैनेजमेंट इज इम्पॉर्टेंट दैट हाउ वी शुड नो दैट इमीडिएटली स्टार्ट आई आई वी फ्लूड इमीडिएटली सैम्पल सेंड फॉर द ब्लड एंड इमीडिएटली एक्सपर्ट पर्सन शुड बी कम्स टू मैनेज द थिंग एंड द सेम वे वन कैन हैंडल दिस Dr. Bharti, can I add something? Yeah. You know, I'd like to just add something. You know, once it is done, we have to be, you know, explaining to the patient what happened because in our back of our mind, like you also mentioned, that litigation is a thing. But if we explain, be honest with our patient, explain them what happened, and tell them how we're going to follow them up and what are the things, so uh, people uh, they do understand. It's nothing to feel, I mean, guilty and really. Procedure, na. Before yes. procedure, because if we do that, after that we explain it, then yes, yes. sometimes they don't understand. So every procedure informed consent that this can occur, this can occur. So definitely. And uh, there is a one very common question and very common situation. That's why I have kept this slide. Anyone can take this. That you are doing the medical methods. You have given the patients. Everything is all right. And then he, she, after four or five days, she comes to you with heavy bleeding. So uh, what you should do? Anyone can do. Anyone can answer. सो बेसिकली यू ये बहुत कॉमन है या तो वो कहीं खा के आती है या इवन आपने भी दिया तो अगर पेशेंट का ब्लीड वाइटल स्टेबल्स है देन यू डू द क्लिनिकल एग्जामिनेशन एंड इफ यू फाउंड द प्रोडक्ट ऑफ कंफ्यूशन एट ऑल इज जस्ट टू वैक इफ यू आर नॉट फाइंडिंग देन यू डू अल्ट्रासाउंड अल्ट्रासाउंड इफ देर इज नॉन वायबल जस्टिशन है कंडीशनल डोज यू कैन डे एंड फॉलो अप आफ्टर सेवन डेज एंड इफ देर इज अ वायबल सैक देन डेफिनेटली हैव टू रिमूव इट बाई वैक्यूम एस्परेशन नो सैक डेसिबल बेस देन यू कैन लीव द पेशेंट ऑन द कंजर्वेटिव ट्रीटमेंट इफ वाइटल is unstable then of course you have to first resuscitate the woman and then you have to do the evacuation and again in this series just i want to show you all this uh, chart and i think we should keep this in the labor room and our uh, working place because this is very subjective that kitna blood loss hua and uh, during the procedure the all staff and all health workers and all our residents all our uh, doctors and all we must understand that how we can assess so i think that is um, many parameters many uh, uh, things are uh, uh, innovated and how we can measure the blood loss but this picture pictorial reference ki agar ek pura pad so small pad so swab hai around 10 into 10 to lagbhag 60 ml ka hai and agar 100 uh, cm diameter wala floor is pillar hai na around 15 hai to ek idea rehta hai and sign of shock we must all must know and then i have very good slide where i think that the basic thing that when pulse is 100 per minute and bp normal then we must think that blood loss can be 1200 mm or more but if pulse is less than 100 then of course around within 1000 ml of blood and if pulse is tachycardia 120 per minute then definitely you should say that more than 1500 blood loss may be there so these are the important thing that you tell about the severity of blood loss and this is very important also that how you maintain that fluid management is very important and you have to uh, of course uh, iv line with wide bore cannula 16 to 18 gauze that is very important and and especially the cases we know that is the high risk cases and then beside that catheterization small small things rapid infusion using cannula number 16 with normal saline ringer lactate 1 liter in fast fast fluid if there is a hemorrhage and beside that of four oxytocin uh, eutrotonic ducts we all know oxygenation and such things we almost know it till uh, sometimes it happened that uh, it happened in the uh, some procedures and a small uh, doctors junior doctors or health worker they are calling to senior till that they should know that they have to start these things and volume replacement we all must know so this was about the if you are doing the procedure sudden hemorrhage but now dr mc patel talk will come in uh, after few minutes then you will understand because here the only thing is the documentation is very important so how do you have to explain how you have to take informed consent and how you have prepare all the things in hand but hamara duty ye bhi hai ki whenever you we are starting the procedure we must see surrounding ki hamare paas life saving drugs hain ki nahi hamare paas eutrotonic drugs hain ki nahi fridge mein prostadin rakha hua hai ki nahi oxytocin proper temperature maintain pe hai ki nahi because we have started and bleeding ho rahi hai to pata laga ki oti chhota wala minor oti kahi hai labor room kahi hai wahan se lao jara prostadin lao ye lao wo lao usme jo time saving uh, time loss hota hai to here these things we can manage ki every patient we have a side uh, emergency the drugs and all things where we patient delays can be stopped and we call for help that we can uh, call our friend so that we can manage properly uh, then uh, other situation 
that is a, a woman she is a previous to lscs and you come in emergency with a scar tenderness you plan her cesarean and you don't have her, her ultrasound don't because she is in emergency if she is having pain and abhi bhi agar aap soch rahe hain ki ye situations mein jab bana rahi thi to main aapko batau ki 10 15 20 din se mai itne patients hamare aa rahe hain mai itni sari awareness ke baad itna hamara government of india ke programs ke baad bhi hum dekhte hain 36 34 weeks pregnancies high risk pregnancies with previous two cesarean they have not taken any antenatal check to jab mai morning mein pata karte ये हुआ तो आई ऑलवेज आज की पूछो कि किस एरिया से आए हैं वहां के आशा और एनम क्यों नहीं यहां तक पहुंच पाए और ये लोग क्यों नहीं पीएससीएससी तक पहुंच पाए तो अभी भी हम इस तरह के पेशेंट देखते हैं जो कि अभी भी हमारे पास इस सिचुएशन में जबकि दे नो सी दो सीजरियन हो चुका है तो अगला सीजरियन होना है एंड स्टिल दे आर वेटिंग एंड दे आर नॉट हैविंग एनी हीमोग्लोबिन दे आर नॉट हैविंग सच टाइप ऑफ थिंग्स सो वी हैव टू मैनेज दीस थिंग्स सो यू इन द इमरजेंसी यू प्लान द सीजरियन सेक्शन एंड ड्यूरिंग सीजरियन प्लेसेंटा इज नॉट रिमूव and patient is bleeding uh, so what uh, dr supriya please uh, highlight the things see what we should do and even if patient not bleeding then what we should do and can we uh, suspect such cases or diagnose uh, earlier dr supriya yes uh, very good evening to all of you and thank you dr lakshmi shrikhandre madam and dr bharti maheshwari for giving me this uh, opportunity to ज्वाइन यू इन चाय पे चर्चा एंड दैट ऑल्सो इन जब कोई बात बिगड़ जाए एक्चुअली नन ऑफ अस वी प्लान दैट समथिंग शुड गो रॉन्ग बट देर आर मेनी रिस्क फैक्टर्स दैट सडनली कम्स टू अस ऑन टेबल एंड वॉट दिस पेशेंट यू आर टेलिंग प्रीवियस टू सी एस एक्चुअली दैट इज ऑलवेज हाई रिस्क केस वी हैव टू मॉनिटर द केस प्रीवियसली योर यो देर वॉज नो ए एन सी एंड वी डोंट नो एनी थिंग अबाउट दिस but usually placenta accreta syndrome this is the adherent placenta that is uh, that is seen here so in this case usually uh, it is a condition where the placenta becomes attached to deeply into the uterine wall there are many conditions it can be uh, placenta accreta increta or percreta depending on the depth of their invasion so sometimes it will even penetrate to the uterine wall and attach to the nearby organs like to the bladder to the other organs so this is always a dangerous situation and ps can occur in women who had previous cesarean deliveries not usually it doesn't happen in a, a primary or such patients so uterine surgery or other condition something whatever surgery has been done on the uterus so this can be a very difficult to manage many a times and it is an obstetrician's nightmare i can tell you so it can cause severe bleeding like you are telling in this case during delivery which can be life threatening to the mother so there are some steps we should take care so uh, as you said ki so we can also diagnose it prenatally also early diagnosis of pa is very important so that the healthcare system we can plan a safe delivery women who are at high risk of Uh, placenta accreta syndrome such as those with previous cesarean delivery should have an ultrasound to check for signs of pas delivery planning is very important if that all the anc should be done carefully if it is diagnosed a plan for delivery should be made in advance so this is to that we are being careful this may involve a team of specialists including an obstetrician supposing i know this the previous two cesarean is having a placenta accreta so we have to involve the team a maternal fetal medicine specialist can be involved anesthetologist she has there has to be there and a urologist the delivery may need to be done in a hospital with everything where the neonatal care unit also there there should be the blood bank because we don't know how much of how many units of blood we can need during the surgery delivery technique is also planned uh, depending on the severity of the pas so the obstetrician or we have to see uh, these use special techniques such as leaving the placenta in place or using a balloon catheter to tamponade the uterus to minimize bleeding to the delivery so there are many other uh, techniques also then blood transfusion the blood transfusion is the mainstay you have to prepare um the blood the patient may require blood transfusion during the surgery or also after surgery we give the blood at him supposing the bleeding doesn't stop 
if the bleeding patient is not bleeding, we can leave the patient as such where the placenta in situ. This is also uh, taking chance. It is important to note that hysterectomy in severe cases where the bleeding is not stopped. It, we cannot manage the bleeding. We have to go for the hysterectomy after counseling, after taking the written consent. We have to be very careful because in the panic stage, the patient's mother or mother-in-law will tell you, save the patient, do this, do that. But later on, if their documentation is not there, they can charge you. They will at once um, put a charge that you have removed the uterus without consent. So hysterectomy is very wisely decided. You have to take care. And then it is also important to note that PS is a serious condition that requires specialized care. Women who are at high risk of PS should be monitored closely during pregnancy and any signs of bleeding or other complications should be reported to the health healthcare provider. We need to have all the emergency medicines, blood, uh, our own team, and so that the uh, this can be managed very well and uh, the patient can be saved. Then, so in this case, I prefer if I uh, the bleeding doesn't stop, I will go for um, hysterectomy. So it is very important for women with placenta clitoris syndrome to receive comprehensive prenatal care. We need to check them routinely and counsel them, counsel their family, the husband, the mother-in-law or the mother that in any emergency can happen and the uterus can um, we may have to remove the uterus. So very clear cut indications, the guidelines, the documentation should be done and to be monitored closely during delivery to help ensure the best possible outcome in this case. So, yes, so Dr. Supriya, you have told uh, very uh, clearly about the uh, this uh, adherent placenta, but here we all must know that uh, this is uh, the any uh, cases where the previous uh, where any uh, cases where the previous cesarean section are there and the history of placenta previa, then in such cases, uh, one have to uh, be very careful about the, uh, doing the all uh, management as well as uh, doing all preparations before doing the surgeries. And again, uh, informed, culture, uh, informed uh, consent is very important. Blood is very important. And as well as if patient is not bleeding, then sometimes you take the decision to continue the, uh, to whatever you remove, you can remove, and then you leave the, for the conservative management and the methotrexate, it is that we all know that it's a dose drug, that can do resolution. Sometimes you need to do the peripartum hysterectomy, but such is the very, uh, the most important part is, that is the um, important part is the blood transfusion and resuscitative management. I think an anesthesia good and good anesthesia team. And uh, the need is that the surgeon, because such things are uh, happening immediately, the issue is that one should not uh, get panic. The, the obstetrician should be experienced. That is very important because sometimes, uh, uh, like when we are talking and when we are uh, discussing theoretically, this is a different when we are in the OT and when we just take out the baby and when see the there is a pore of blood and we are not patient, it is not removing. Then we get um, uh, lots of uh, competence as well as uh, the handling of the patient. So immediately we should have a. a we should take care of uh, other measures like an extra person. They should not be there. No extra talk, blood transfusions, immediately talk to the patient's attendant, then consent of the hysterectomy, as well as the uh, uh, blood transfusions. And uh, you must know the hemaxis and other uh, uh, transfusions that you can use in the life saving. So all these things we must remain. So best thing is that in previous season and section, if you do the uh, ultrasound and you rule out the adherent placenta, nowadays we do and we can do because uh, now in ultrasounds um, we can get and there are very good resolution of ultrasound very good sonologists and even we obstetricians we are very much trained so we have to see that gestation sac in the first trimester localization in the lower uterine segment rather than fundus next to the lower than the previous scar 
then chances that can have adherent placenta then in the second and third trimester presence of irregular lacuni within the placenta loss of retro placenta clear space loss of disruption of the white line bladder line so like not like ultrasound hamare paas report kahin radiology se aaye aur humne bas dekha ki ye itna bhi is pregnancy hai placenta itna great ka hai ye fundal height hai ye uh, iska uh, femur length hai ye isi hai that's all no all because nowadays we have lot of we must get the history that if she is having the past uh, she is having the previous cesarean or in this pregnancy or previous pregnancy she is having then definitely we have to see where is the location of gestation say whether there is a um, bladder lines and uh, what is the uh, disruptions or what is the about the lacuna all things very much if they are not doing then we must ask so this was about abdu so in the same way this was our real patient scenario and this what we have seen our cases that is around uh, i think not more than um, one month back there is a patient that she come with the uh, uh, history of 33 weeks five day gestation with previous procedure referred from a private hospital with bleeding routine investigation showed hemoglobin ultrasound 21 weeks shows complete placenta previa on 30 weeks size and active bleeding was present so uh, like less gestational age and she is having the placenta previa and then she was given blood and all things and management emergency lscs was done and uh, per operatively lower uterine segment was not well formed and placenta was completely covering down after we be extraction placenta was extracted in piece meal and placenta could not be extracted in toto uterine preservation with placental extraction was tried with uterine artery and bilateral internal ligation blood and um, fresh from the plasma they all were transferred but that uh, bleeding was not stopped and due to failure of conservative method peripartum hysterectomy has to be done and post operatively again blood and fresh frozen plasma and platelets they were transfused so pre and post operative management is very important for saving the life of patient not only surgical procedure patient recovered and became fit for discharge within 7 days this is a good thing and uh, histopathological report may found the resected specimen show feature of placenta accreta so this is the इम्पॉर्टेंट थिंग सो वी हैव डिस्कस जब कोई बात बिकल जाए कि हम कोई प्रोसीजर एम टी पी कर रहे हैं एकदम से ब्लीडिंग होने लगी हमने मेडिकल मैथड दिया पेशेंट तीन दिन बाद एकदम ब्लीडिंग होती हुई आई या हम लोगों ने सीजर एंड किया एंड वी फाउंड की पेशेंट इज ब्लीडिंग एंड प्रेजेंट आई एडहरेंट सो दिस वॉज अबाउट द टू डेज and we almost uh, we i just uh, have uh, these two three slides we almost remain aware whenever we are doing the second trimester termination because the study says that 9 to 11% of all induced abortion occur in the second trimester and these are responsible for two third of all major complication so finally to avoid this it is essential that second trimester abortion they are performed as per the criteria laid down in mtp act and rule following the appropriate method and taking all necessary precaution so i always request all of you that you should know where you can do second trimester abortion i think many of us they don't know that in the public sector tertiary level health care care medical college or secondary uh, level like district hospital and they are only fulfill the criteria as per mtp rules to provide the mtp for up to sec 20 weeks like if there is a psc and there is you do and you, or you do there the 20 weeks termination that it is a uh, violation and if it, there is some emergency and to save the patient's life you have to do then of course you can do but you have to within the 24 hours you have to report to the cmo psc and non designated which who do not fulfill the eligibility criteria community health center they are not permitted to offer second trimester mtp services private sector facilities are permitted to provide second trimester after approval from district level committee with mtp rule so i always request you all of you that you don't know ki kab baat bigde par jab baat bigde to kam se kam humne itna arrangement hamara hai ki hum ek uh, legal um, perspective mein we are right so that there of course aap kitne bhi acche clinician se aapne 100 cases acche kare agar aapke ek case mein complication hua aur usi patient mein bhi hua to bhi you can have litigation so but there is nothing to afraid because you you we all know that complication they are expected complication and you have done all things under the law so that's why we should all taken care and then nothing to uh, uh, nothing to scared and we have to uh, of course improve our skills and all criteria where the patient can be saved no uh, stone should be unturned so that we cannot kill the patient and this is very important only two things where the we can have a optimal results and optimal saving of patient that is counseling and clinical examination to see that is very important and the counseling because patient get ready she tell you truth 
and even in next uh, pregnancy they take care of at least kam se kam do cesarean ho gaye usko pata hona chahiye to teesre cesarean mein to wo shuru se antenatal check up karaye apna ultrasound karaye because patient doesn't come for the first trimester ultrasound aap karenge kaise so these things is very important and if some is happening agar they should understand that these things can um, happen and then clinical examination this is the very important history you can rule out the cases who are high risk for uh, threaten the complication life threatening complication so you can manage the things accordingly pata laga ki aapke staff hai aapke junior residents hai unhone koi is correct topic ko termination shuru kar diya patient labor wahan ot mein behne laga ekdam bleed hone laga and then jo cheez bachai ja sakti thi hum pehle se clinically usko diagnose karke then that things should be happen and definitely we all should remain aware about the possible complications of all procedures and um, so uh, now i think last uh, uh, summary is that uh, complications uh, we all must understand and we must do uh, psc csc they all are uh, the different levels where you can handle the different uh, complications and i think all uh, dr uh, arup in beginning told about the different eutotonic drugs so we all understand that nowadays there are many eutotonic drugs that uh, we can Uh, that we can use uh, uh, like and we should know that how they have to be managed and how they have to be uh, kept like we, many don't know ki oxytocin uh, uh, they should keep in the temperature maintain temperature toxidin they should maintain temperature that's why carbido carbido say nowadays they have come we have done some uh, thesis also when they was a too hot and we were thinking that we are not able to maintain the temperature so that is the thing that efficacy of particular drug has to be मेनटेन ओनली देन अदरवाइज आपने आठ ऑक्सीटोसिन लगा दी आपको लग रहा है ब्लीडिंग तो रुकी रही है हमने सारा मेडिकल ट्रीटमेंट दे दिया फेल हो गया एंड नाउ वॉट वी हैव टू डू सो दिस वॉज द थिंग्स एंड इन द लास्ट ऑल पेनलिस्ट ओनली वन वन लाइन फॉर द लाइफ सेकनी लाइफ सेविंग एफर्ट्स इन द केसेज ऑफ जब कोई बात भी कर जाए या नहीं मैं तो कुछ कह दिया मेरा तो काउंसलिंग एंड क्लिनिकल एग्जामिनेशन मेरे को लगा कि दिस इज द बेस्ट थिंग क्योंकि आप बचा तो नहीं सकते कॉम्प्लिकेशन नहीं एंड एक्चुअली देयर वाज अ क्वेश्चन आल्सो इन द चैट बॉक्स अबाउट हाउ डू यू डिफरेंशिएट स्कार प्रेगनेंसी विद एवी मेलफॉर्मेशंस सो आई डिड हैव वन सच पेशेंट वी टर्नड आउट टू बी एवी मेलफॉर्मेशंस एक्वायर्ड सो इट हैज टू बी एक्चुअली व्हेन द पेशेंट कंटीन्यूज टू ब्लीड after the evacuation it is mandatory to get a color doppler done because that will help us to differentiate whether it's av malformations or scar pregnancy so be very clear on that that you get a color doppler done differentiate and then and somehow luckily my patient has actually become all right with heavy doses of progesterone which i kept her on for 3 to 4 months she did not lose follow up so i could monitor her regularly beta hcg kept on going down and uh, Uh, that i gave a methotrexate there was no response because i thought maybe some pieces are there and there is av malformation but av malformation was there so heavy doses of progesterone were really helpful and now she is all right so because i thought if i go in for uh, uterine artery embolization she won't have a child this was the first one so she will never be able to conceive because otherwise the uh, vascularity and all will be disrupted in the uterus so i did not go in for that i went in for progesterone therapy and that really worked well bilkul theek hai and it is true yeah, if you, Actually, if you are uh, if you ask me to say that. one line yes, one yes. point only uh, to save the mother in actually labor room when starts bleeding you give a large bore needle uh, infusion ha huh. so that is cannulation is very very important but once once the patient goes to shock it's very difficult to uh, introduce the right candle that is gray very, color candela uh, gray color candela 16 large bore needle you must uh, introduce this is very important later on we will not bleed. and second thing is the about the scar ectopy i think uh, don't uh, if there is a severe bleeding to seem scar ectopy for vaginal evacuation we should not uh, do nothing at the nothing at the and keep resuscitated the patient and uh, uh, do accordingly what has been uh, described to me And no but if she continues to bleed you have to go in for surgical management if she is continuously pouring 
then you have to uh, do some surgical management. That, that is the waste is the, <coughs> that the waste is the balloon. You have already said. Uh, I told her. Balloon, balloon therapy is actually uh, you will not uh, other thing there. Uh, balloon therapy is very uh, double balloon is available. Double balloon, one balloon inside and other balloon. Uh, it will uh, uh, spray give compression over the uh, the scar. Uh, regarding the uh, placenta activator spectrum, if it is a diagnosed case of placenta activator spectrum, you should go to the elective cesarean section and followed by the most majority of the cases, hysterectomy is the standard guideline. So these uh -huh. are the uh, three things uh, of the three. Uh, <laughs> that, that's all. I have uh, really have learned a lot, particularly the Bharati's presentation, sir. Dr. Bharati's presentation, I have seen many things, and also from the Dr. Meena and Dr. Ranjana and Supriya. Thank you all. We will go to the next session, I think. So, and just next... one line from um, me. Yeah. No, yeah. Because that was also in the question regarding any precautionary measures before going in for an MTP or evacuation. Yes, we have to be uh, very mindful of the shape of the uterus if there are any yes. fibroids. Yes. Or if it is a distorted uterine cavity, if we look on that. And if it is some case which is already handled outside. So those high-risk cases, uh, what people have started doing, though not that I'm practicing, but on the safer side, some people are even doing ultrasound-guided evacuation uh, in high-risk cases where the uterine uh, cavity is distorted. And they, so this is something special. One of my friends, was working abroad, uh, uh, her unit is, has taken up this project of doing ultrasound guided. So that is something we can pick up. That is what Dr. Supriya, yes. Yes. Uh, Madam, one line from me will be, we can anticipate hemorrhage in ev every case. We should be We should be ready to face any challenge. And early recognition and prompt management is the uh, main, main step because uh, the more fast we diagnose and promptly we treat, so we can save life. So this yeah, because life. Dr. Lakshmi has aptly said that uh, obstetrics is a bloody uh, practice. And it is. Yes. <laughs> so I think we are towards the end of the panel. But here the thing is that we obstetricians, they all should know aware about the, like, uh, the things about like scar ectopic can occur, that and then placenta can occur. So what we have to do, we malformation. So in every patient actually required that in the, I think in the next five to 10 years, that we will have the Doppler and ultrasounds in every patient in early pregnancies, like in the Western countries. So they have less maternal mortality, I mean less than one, less than two. I think they have so less complications because they can anticipate the things earlier. And uh, but things are improving. I am saying, th uh, saying that access to many life-saving things are now more either the ambulance, either uh, blood. Now it's becoming uh, more easily available. Definitely, uh, we are doing. But again, we are lack of uh, I think uh, experts, doctors. So sometimes we. Um, uh, we have to do uh, very extra efforts uh, to handle the things. So I hope that all of uh, together we will handle our patient best. And jab koi baat bigar jaye, so we will remain every in every patient ready. Ki jaise hi baat bigre, ham usko samal le ki wo jada na bigar pay. Thank you very much for um, this uh, panel discussions and my esteemed learned panelists. And uh, many of have uh, requested that they want um, uh, this link or uh, some recording. So, um, uh, I think this is very, uh, after this I will talk to Lakshmi Madam, that as they will put it on YouTube, then the link will be generated from YouTube. They will also have their own channel of YouTube, so we can share the old ones and that link we can share all of them. It doesn't take any time. And in time, they will also have their own ICOG websites on their recordings. So that we can have it. Thank you very much. And now we move to our next section. Lakshmi, madam, are you here? Yeah, yeah, I am very much here. Uh, all the recordings will be uploaded yes. on ICOG website. So, I mean, any people can uh, access it's to it. It's a good thing because I also record my function. Then it can't be saved on my phone. I can't share. So, I tried to see how much of the YouTube can be there. We can do it and you can do it. So, whatever you are recording, you can go to the link from there. And you can put it on your website. If you put it on your days wide, then you can do it on your own. You can do it on your own. Like you have so many programs. So thank you very much.
तो मैडम आप भी एक लाइन बता दीजिए लक्ष्मी मैम ऑप्शेटिक सैमरेज के लिए आपने तो बताई दी हम तो कुछ नहीं सबको वही बोला है कि इट्स अ नाइस डे एंड यू ऑल हैव टू बी प्रिपेयर्ड एंड इन केस इट ऑकर्स देन यू हैव टू एक्ट फास्ट रियल फास्ट टू सेव दैट लाइफ 15 अच्छा तो डॉक्टर एमसी पटेल ने लिया उनका कहां क्या है नहीं रहे हैं डॉक्टर एमसी सर यू आर हियर सर आप हो डॉक्टर चारमिला भी नहीं दिख रही है मुझे देख रही हूं मैं उनको गैलरी में एमसी पटेल सर को यस आई एम हियर हां हां ग्रेट 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 सो गुड इवनिंग सर एंड वी हैव यू एंड यू नो दैट जब कोई बात बिगड़ जाए में सबसे पहले हमें आप ही एंड मेडिकल लीगल इश्यूज सबसे ज्यादा इंपॉर्टेंट है दैट वी हैव टू हाउ वी शुड हैंडल एंड हाउ वी शुड टॉक सो नाउ इन द नेक्स्ट टॉपिक वी हैव नन अदर देन डॉक्टर एम सी पटेल सर वी ऑल नो अबाउट हिम दैट इज अ कंसल्टेंट ऑफ स्टेटिशियन एज वेल एज ही वॉज अ वाइस प्रेसिडेंट फॉक्सी टू जीरो वन एट ऑर्गेनाइजिंग सेक्रेटरी आई सी जी टू जीरो वन सेवन चेयरपर्सन एथिक एंड मेडिकल लीगल कमेटी टू जीरो वन वन टू टू जीरो टू थ्री so uh, we have uh, him now for uh, this next talk and that is what have to how have to handle when there is a life threatening uh, some complication occur so sir now it's to you i am just uh, stop sharing i have not shared i think okay so the is it seen no, i screen? have stopped now you can share your screen is it seen yes 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 so i will uh, uh, restrict to topic death on table uh, because in given time to cover whole topic is very difficult and back to back i have to attend one more webinar at 6 pm only so greetings from statue of unity tallest statue of world and we all are proud of that statue it is not moving i think your screen is not moving for any reason ek baar click karke fir se kariye sir ah wahi wahi karna padega yes warm welcome all the delegates and wishing you a litigation free practice at the outset i would like to thank icog chair dr lakshmi and dr bharti in particular for inviting me to share my views about the subject death on table many times we are very happily enjoying our surgery and when we see tracing on ecg monitoring like this we are always happy but many times when it becomes a straight line and it becomes a nightmare condition for any of us and then in this situation when one is confused and one may try to hide the thing one may be panic and there are so many questions in the mind what to do how to manage the situation kya karu kya karu bhag jaau kon bachayega mujhe and one is very scared in this type of situation so how to manage how to counsel and how to defend this situation is the topic so first rule of course it is very difficult to keep quiet but first rule is do not panic because death per se doesn't mean negligence in eye of law it is very clear and res ipsa loquitur principle is not immediately applied so death per se is not negligence so nothing to worry in this type of situation also as far as medical legal problems are concerned because the two three uh, things are taken into consideration was doctor qualified to treat or operate or give anesthesia and one more thing has he acted in a way, way in which any ordinary skilled doctor with same degree would have acted in that given situation so if you have managed patient way in which any prudent gynecologist would have managed you could be out of problem so and in this type of situation references of standard textbook guidelines or protocols from journals practices in nearby medical college hospital and practice in peer group taken into consideration and some references are also taken into consideration in court of law whenever you are facing a case of death on table 
and of course expert affidavits when you put expert affidavits in your favor in court of law in uh, court it is also considered so tip number 2 relax and resuscitate so mission resuscitate so anesthesiologist will lead the team and followed by surgeon followed by physician because surgeon is the captain of ship only if surgery goes well but in adverse situation the anesthesiologist is the captain of ship and he is the best person as far as cpr is concerned if he is not available and something has happened say for example during normal uh, delivery or so an anesthesiologist is not there then who ever is available can start cpr but this is common and typical conversation in ot during this type of situation and when we have started resuscitation sister adrenaline kaha hai sister get me hemasil fast sister defibrillator charge karke kyun nahi rakha laryngoscope mein cell kon dalega tera these are the very common conversation during this type of situation oxygen cylinder khali hai sister ye check karna kiska kaam hai so these are some situation in corporate hospital there is a crash cart but in small nursing home we should have emergency tray with all the emergency drugs and iv fluids iv sets blood sets intracap syringes and needles emergency injections and tablets sticking plaster seizures ampule cutter and oxygen cylinder pana why i have written oxygen cylinder pana in one of the case we japan in state of gujarat only on fourth day of cesarean infection patient succumb in the ward He, she was resuscitated well and uh, she was saved but even then case was filed and allegation was when she suffered this problem there was no oxygen cylinder pana available and relative had a statement that i went to the market i came with pana and then only oxygen could be given to the patient so not to end up into this type of allegation we should have oxygen cylinder pana available around the clock lma that is laryngeal mask is need of today's time to save life as well as in court of law also check your equipments instrument medicine at regular intervals and keep them up to date on safety regulations and emergency kit how many times this situation can arise in our hospital in this type of situation day on table or any emergency condition no ampule of adrenaline available no ampule of mephent in many times what can we do in such situation will you give prescription to the relative of patient to rush to the market and to have uh, ampule of adrenaline or mephent in so very clear message never give prescription of emergency drug to relative in this situation you manage by your own staff only because whenever this type of thing happens and if relative issue received of adrenaline or mephentin then it becomes a very tricky situations to face in court of law because the same time of case happened in city of pune only it was intra operative cardiac arrest resuscitation was done well ultimately patient went into vegetative form doctor had advice from medical legal advisor and he had prepared a note very nicely notes were perfect documentation were up to date but she had a given of prescription of battery cell for her pulse oximeter to the relative and due to that only case was decided against doctor because allegation on part of relative was uh, husband was my wife is in this situation because of no proper monitoring in time so these are some problem one more area call for help in this type of situation when you are dealing with a serious emergency or sudden cardiac arrest or so call for help is a very important thing because whenever somebody uh, is with you to help you it is always better for patient as well as for you also so in this type of situation if there is a rush team in your society then you have to phone call only one or two person they will phone call to some other, another person and whosoever is available nearby will rush to your hospital to help them uh, help you so rush team in each and every society is very much need of time because balanced team work is always beneficial 
not only to the patient, but to doctor also. So very important role of rest name. So as far as surgical assistance is concerned, say for example, if it is a severe case of PPH, an internal iliac ligation is to be done. And if you are not well versed with internal iliac ligation, in this type of situation, any member of rest team who is uh, available and who is well versed with uh, this type of surgical assistance may be at your rescue. Declaring bad news is also very important thing and rest team is uh, always uh, to be helpful uh, in this type of situation. In case of mob violence, in case of assault, and then after legal assistance. So role of rest team is very crucial in this type of situation. So many times, whenever we call member to help, many times they are feared to come for help because they consider kon jamele mein padega. Lekin never hesitate to go for help because this time this has happened to somebody else place. Anytime it may happen to our place also. So we should be ready to be helpful to our professional colleague in this type of situation. Remember, law always protect good Samaritans. Many a times we are uh, afraid that if at all we goes, uh, go to uh, rescue and some legal problems happen, then they may us also as a party. But in this type of situation in law, it is a very clear thing. Though good Samaritan law is not prevalent in India, it is of course in UK, but its principles are taken into consideration in court of law. And good Samaritan is accountable only if he has done palpably wrong. So to be helpful to any of our professional colleague is no uh, matter of uh, legal proceeding in future also. So never hesitate to go for help whenever you are called. This is also a very important thing. Even if you are closing abdomen of dead patient, then also go for count for everything. Because uh, close with mop count. Because in one of the cases it happened, it was death of patient on table and very hurriedly abdomen was closed and mop was left inside. And during post-mortem examination, mop was found. So in this type of situation also, we should be very careful not to leave anything inside. Shifting patient to tertiary care center after death. There are two conditions, before death or after death. After death, many times in past also, it was very uh, common advice that make a show to shift patient to higher center in ICU and make a show that you have taken utmost care for resuscitation and ultimately declare death of patient. But in this type of situation, death in OT versus death in ICU, it is a misconcept because this is real happen case in city of Pune only. 27 years old boy, known case of rheumatic heart disease, history of heavy drinking and dancing in political friends marriage, brought dead in casualty by his friends and casualty medical officer on duty declared that he was brought dead. And Within no time, more than 100 people gathered and there was damage to the hospital and ransacking of hospital. So that casualty medical officer decided or made a mind, never immediately declare in any patient dead when brought dead in casualty. And you won't believe in the same hospital with same medical officer in the same month, this type of uh, incidents happened again, again, a uh, dead body was taken to the hospital uh, uh, saying that serious and do something. And he told nothing can be done here. He is very serious. You please take this to another hospital. Patient was taken to another hospital. That hospital received dead body. And now question was whether patient was already dead or patient was living when that re referred hospital uh, received the uh, patient. And there was a question, who will issue death certificate? So in this type of situation, it becomes a very difficult to manage this type of situation. And as per in eye of law, it is easier to fight a case of negligence rather than that of forgery. Because if you can uh, go to make a show like this, it becomes a case of forgery. If patient is already dead, and if you declare that he's serious and if you see patient to higher center, it becomes a case of forgery and it is non-billable offense. So never end into this type of problem. So 
this is very important thing in this type of situation because in present day there are cctv camera etc there everywhere and it is very difficult to be excused of this type of forgery before death one more condition shifting patient uh, in nearby hospital before death in a serious condition so again it is a double edged decision because if it is too early then why you didn't resuscitate it and sent to the hospital and if it is too late then why you didn't send early so in this type of situation take collective decision which can be justified in court of law when to shift avoid shifting hemodynamically unstable patient because she may die on the way and it could be troublesome to uh, face in court of law who will decide where patient is to be transferred or the patient is to be referred of course it is decision on patient and patient party you can advise them but they may have choice to go to government trust or private hospital or medical college hospital and when you give all the papers of treatment given have a signature if patient is in a position to sign fine otherwise husband or any other relative or witnesses with date and time when patient left your hospital escort of patient is very much important and in the same ambulance because in one of the case which again happened in city of pune only doctor escorted the patient but doctor was in his own car patient was in ambulance and during transit she suffered heart attack and patient couldn't be saved and case was decided against doctor even though he had accompanying the patient but he was not in the same ambulance so one should accompanying the patient in the same ambulance with all emergency drugs iv fluids and oxygen cylinder if treating doctor is busy busy then equally qualified person should escort the patient and in this type of situation anesthesiologist is the best person to escort patient use of pneumatic anti shock garment in case of shock is very important tool and it saves time and many times life of patient could be saved with this uh, uh, instrument also one more very important area confirm about availability of bed operation theater icu instrument like ventilator with right and proper person where you are referring the patient because once patient reaches there and ventilator is not available and patient is in bad need of ventilator and patient will have to shift it to another hospital and precious time is wasted so in this type of situation it is always better to confirm availability of bed operation theater ventilator with right and proper person transfer document you have to submit all the uh, uh, document to the patient uh, patient uh, party proper transfer note and all the documents so in this type of document name of patient date and time of referral reason for referral details of condition of the patient vitals when first seen vitals when referred history of comorbidity like diabetes mellitus or hypertension or so operative details if you have operated patient copies of indoor uh, uh, papers with all investigation uh, done uh, uh, transferred in ambulance yes or no arranged by hospital or arranged by patient accompanying by who accompanying the patient and with all details of equipments oxygen cylinder etc monitor details during transit also about pulse blood pressure saturation respiratory rate details of any events during transit and name and conduct uh, contact number of the doctor staff of tertiary care hospital where you are referring the patient date and time of handing over the a patient to the in charge person at referred hospital is very much important and this is checklist which kind of document you have uh, to give to the patient party at the time of transferring the patient but you have not to remember all this thing you have to simply visit foxy website and on foxy website there is uniform foxy concern available we three uh, medical legal expert uh, dr dilip walke from pune dr nikhil datar from mumbai and myself dr mc patel from amdavad we have prepared almost 30 different consent say for example cesarean section hysterectomy abdominal vaginal endoscopic termination of pregnancy medical method surgical method transferring patient to higher center and so on so everything is available at the time of trans transferring patient which kind of document we have to give to the patient which kind of precaution we have to take everything is there available on foxy website preserve transfer notes of patient transfer to higher uh, center 
This is also very much important. Handing over a patient to proper person, see, in charge or CMO medical officer with your reference note and letters and have an acknowledgement on Xerox copy of the notes with date and time. Because date and time when patient left your hospital and date and time when patient was received at referring the hospital, it is very much important. One more area, complete the paperwork because these are the patients, these are the cases which may end up into litigation. So paperwork should be completed as soon as we are little free of this event. So try writing good notes about suscitations, resuscitation in this situation. And in this type of situation, printed protocols for cardiac arrest and anaphylaxis are always at your help. So no important point should be missed as far as uh, documentation is concerned. And it is very natural. Good record is good defense. Poor record is poor defense. And no record is no defense. And it has been my experience during my medical legal practice. We doctors are very poor as far as record keeping is concerned. So record is always at your rescue. So keep them up to date. What was done, nothing was neglected. Given treatment fully met with standard demanded by law and ethics. And it should be easily acceptable whenever offered in the court. Because doctor is bound to produce record whenever asked by the court. And if he doesn't, then adverse inference might be drawn. This is also a very important thing, important bill, important bill of purchase of oxygen cylinder, defibrillator, ventilator, instrument, uh, emergency instrument like ambu bag, emergency drug. And one more important thing, refilling of oxygen cylinder, important bill of refilling of oxygen cylinder is also good document because in one of the case which happened in state of Gujarat only, there was allegation when patients suffered heart attack, oxygen cylinder were empty we could produce a bill of refilling of oxygen cylinder just one day prior of this accident happened and we were saved in court of law. So this is also one more important document as far as refilling of oxygen cylinder is concerned. And as far as records are concerned, concerned they, it should be in a chronological order, not too perfect because many times we prepare very perfect document. But if on prosecution, if you are asked, that you produce record of all the co-patients and records are not maintained in other patients like this patient, then it becomes a very difficult in court of law. So not too perfect. It should not be visibly manipulated. No omission of obvious step, no contradictory notes. Say for example, PPH versus amniotic fluid embolism. So your note should be very confirmative as far as your diagnosis is concerned. Absence of consent, and now death has occurred. So many times few of our friends have a habit to have a thumb impression of patient. Never do like this. No thumb impression, please. Because it is very difficult in court of law because uh, in this type of situation, uh, it becomes a very difficult situation to face in court of law. You should have a, a more than one set of copy available uh, to be uh, given to the investigating officer whenever you are asked for the record. One more area, set OT in order. Before you allow anybody inside OT, then you should have a very clear vision as far as your OT is concerned. So Swachta Abhyan, but you have to make it little clear, but you have to preserve everything in the OT because you cannot dispose of anything because it becomes a destroying evidences. So clean the floor, which is blood stain but all the clothes should be with uh, you in the OT only. Dispose the blood stain drips. Check all the equipment, especially whether oxygen cylinder is full. Save used material. Check expiry dates because in again in city of Pune only in one of the cases, everything was fine, but one ampule of uh, emergency drug medicine found with expiry date and case was decided against doctor. So in this type of situation, very quickly you should check that no ampule or no injection should be with expiry date should be available in OT. Check whether catheters and endotracheal tube is in place. Check whether IV line is in place because at the time of punch nama, all this taken into consideration. So declaration of bad news now, it is very important thing in this type of situation. But before this, would you like to communicate with your staff always? Yes. 
because usually in this type of situation radio patient will ask to your aya or metrani mosi kya hua andar and many times there will be different word from your staff and it becomes very difficult in this type of situation so you should have a word with your staff nurse aya metrani and receptionist what happened why it happened and what we did so all our staff or everybody should be speaking in the same synchrony or in the same direction now it is very important with communication with relative so <clears throat> if you are available with rest team then it is always better to declare this type of bad news in presence of a member of rest team because you are protected from being man handled and they help in communication with the relative or patient so never even think of running away unless situation is out of hand if you are in end danger then naturally you have to uh, run away from the hospital but whenever this type of situation happens you straight away go to police station because it shows your concern otherwise uh, it becomes a very bad impression that you absconded from the hospital so if you are in a danger of course leave the hospital in this type of situation and go to police station it is very important thing main chair belongs to the owner or head of the institution and he will have a communication with the relative of the patient he will declare bad news hum aapki patni ko bacha nahi sake it looks good in in the film but in our practice it is not so simple to say like this so whenever you are dealing with a high risk pregnancy cases or serious patient then inform condition to the relative time to time so they should be mentally prepared to face the situation by senior most person and not junior face together with rest team if available be polite and sympathetic but but assertive be prepared for knee jerk hostile reaction also be prepared for mob frenzy do not lose patient and it is very important do not blame each other when more than one doctor is involved in treating patient in this type of situation please do not blame each other it is very important and making statements that might be construed as an admission of fault on your part should always be avoided and this these are some very important question comes in our mind should all maternal death be informed to police who has onus of asking for mlc post mortem examination if cause of death is known say for example known case of pph can we give death certificate and can appropriate authority doing death review pull us up for not doing post mortem examination in case of maternal death so in this type of situation how we should manage the situation is very important death certificate can be given if cause of death is known and there is no law that you cannot give death certificate if cause of death is very known <coughs> so as far as post mortem examination is concerned if you are not sure of cause of death always advise to go for post mortem examination but if it is sudden death on table many a times uh, question ask whatever happened in four wall of your operation theater or labor room is not known to or it is not accessible to the relative or patient so post mortem examination should be advised many a times it is a question if there was a case of some intra operative or immediate post operative death would you send body for post mortem examination or give death certificate and many a time relatives are ready to give an undertaking we do not want to go for post mortem examination but this type of writing doesn't stand in court of law this type of writing has no legal immunity no legal stand in court of law so in this type of situation we should advise post mortem examination so call police the involvement of police is very crucial in this type of situation and once you inform police one police is there then now dead body is in custody of police and police will arrange for post mortem examination and relative uh, if at all refuses then it is job of police to convince them or to go for post mortem examination straight away should we know section of arrest because in this type of situation many times there is a, a request or there is a demand on part of relative to the police to arrest doctor so we should know some clause for the same in famous case of jacob matthews in which was decided in supreme court in 2005 there were three guidelines given 
in Supreme Court about arrest of doctor in this type of situation. Private complaint may not be entertained unless the complainant has produced a prima facie evidence before court in form of credible opinion given by another competent doctor to support charges of rashness and negligence against accused doctor. <clears throat> Number two, before proceeding against doctor accused of rest or negligent act or omission, investigating officers should obtain an independent and competent medical opinion, preferably from respective department in government hospital, who is expected to be impartial and unbiased and who applies principle of Bollum test to the incidents. And <clears throat> guideline number three, doctor accused of raceness or negligence may not be arrested in routine manner unless his arrest is necessary for furthering investigation or collecting evidence or officer feels that doctor may not make himself available to face the prosecution. So these are three guidelines. And in one more case of Martin D'Souza, Justice Kazu had also given some guidelines that he has stressed the importance of expert opinion in medical negligence cases at the stage of admission of case itself. And he has also <clears throat> mentioned that law is watchdog and not blood wound. And Bolan test should be taken into consider consideration, fixing the medical negligence on part of patients. So again, he gave all those three guidelines which were given in case of Jacob Matthews. And he has added one more thing. If police had exercised or overpowered, then police is also liable for punishment. And this is later <clears throat> from uh, uh, home department in Gujarat it, in 2004, we had a seminar and we invited home uh, minister and uh, home secretary and we requested there are laws in favor of doctor in this type of situation, but in police station, either police have no knowledge. So this type of letter was issued to each and every police station of Gujarat that in case of this type of situation, how to deal with a doctor with all the guidelines. So what to do and how to prevent all this uh, situation? Because whenever you are facing this type of situation, high risk cases or death on table, these are the questions you have to face. Was it preventable? Yes. And if it is yes, then what did you do to prevent it? Why you couldn't prevent it? Because in spite of all your care and caution, many times you cannot prevent all the situations. So this question will be asked. Did you diagnose, is, uh, diagnose in time? And very important question will be asked. Did you manage way in which any prudent doctor would have managed? If you can answer all those questions, then you could be <clears throat> out of problem in this type of situation. So what to do and how to prevent practice foreseeability or anticipation, good communication and proper consent and proper documentation, and you will be simply sailed through. Because law expect us from, uh, from us that we should anticipate certain condition or high risk cases, or we should be readily available with intensive care. Say for example, if you are dealing with a history of previous two LSCS, and this type, if it is a central placenta previa, naturally one should anticipate that she may end up into a severe PPH and she may require blood transfusion. Even she may require obstetric hysterectomy also. You, so you should anticipate and you should be readily available to deal with situation. So discuss with the relative on admission whenever you are dealing with a high risk pre, uh, 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 pregnancy cases and inform relative time by time to time uh, ed, uh, case advances because it is very important thing in court of law. So proper counseling is very much important. And in this famous case of C. Jaipal Reddy versus Padmini Velluri, National Commission has very specifically mentioned that consent is not mere piece of paper where patient or relative has to sign but it is a very important document of your counseling. So whatever you have counseled to the patient, whatever you have communicated to the patient, you have to mention everything in consent paper and then patient has to sign. And just I mentioned prior also, it is available on Foxy <coughs> website in Foxy Uniform Consent and we three medical legal experts have prepared this. So you can utilize those consent in your day-to-day -day practice. It is uh, uh, prepared in two parts. Part one is information about all these things, name of procedure, meaning, purpose, description, benefit of procedure, alternatives, consequences of refusal, and <clears throat> outline substantial risk, anesthesia, excessive bleeding, possibility of infection, injury to surrounding structures. Every individual has a different way to cope up 
very rare condition like allergic reaction to any drug and neonatal outcome with morbidity and possibility of mortality. And part two is undertaking whatever we have explained in part one, patient will go in undertaking in part two and at the end of patient either sign or thumb impression. And if it is thumb impression, then it should be attested with a person who knows the patient with two witnesses, one in favor of hospital, one in favor of doctor, uh, uh, patient and signature of doctor who has counsel patient, who has taken consent is very much important. So proper documentation, and whenever you take signature on consent paper, it becomes a documentation of your communication. And when you offer all those paper in court of law, it becomes a communication of documentation. Because in spite of all our prof uh, this professional and occupational hazard, our journey to serve human and mankind is always on and on. These gentlemen have so many staircases, but he doesn't know how to use them. So it doesn't matter how many resources you have, if you do not know how to use them, they will never be enough. There are so many clauses in a law and there are so many provisions in law in our favor as far as medical practice is concerned. But if we do not know, they will never be helpful in any given situation. So have some basic legal knowledge, always obtain medical legal advice whenever you are in doubt. So if you want to sleep like this, take tender care of your patient, pray your, pray, pray your almighty God before going to sleep and keep my visiting card below your pillow. And this is law of leopard behind yours and gynecologist and see the role of medical legal counselor. So please do not hesitate to take help of medical legal counselor whenever you are in need and see how he can be useful in any given situation. And very rightly said by Albert Einstein, only two things are infinite, the universe and human stupidity. And I am not so sure about the former. So wish you and me to all the best and God bless you. Have a litigation free medical practice with regards, salute to all. And thank you again, Lakshmi and Dr. Bharti for inviting me to share my views about the subject. Thank you, thank you very much. Please do not assume, please ask if query, any query, any question, if time and chairpersons permit. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you, sir, uh, thank you. <laughs> And it was really, uh, all, as usual, very informative talk and uh, uh, very relevant uh, regarding this theme and topic. So I hope that we all will uh, develop practice to maintain records for good communication as well as uh, giving proper information to the patient time to time by some senior doctor. So uh, now we come to the next topic without doing any delay. Uh, we have with us uh, Dr. Shamila. We all know that Dr. Shamila, um, she was the vice president, uh, she is the elected vice president. And Dr. Shamila uh, is a very, really charming personality, very academic and uh, uh, very, uh, uh, very social. And she is the vice president elect 2024 chairperson clinical research committee, ICOG governing council member, national coordinator. Uh, UNICEF, FOXI, PCA, as well as uh, WHO and uh, SEARO, MDSR, India member, past secretary, Trishi Oji Society, President of National Hygiene Management uh, Consortium 2018-2020, Joint Secretary Justoti. So I know her personally, she is very academic, very sweet person, and uh, she is my good friend also. So, uh, Dr. Shamila, you are here? Yeah, yeah, I'm there. Yeah, she is there. Thank yes, you so much. Sir. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Bharati, for that uh, kind and sweet introduction. I'd like to thank Lakshmi Shri Kande, Madam, for the opportunity, as well as Dr. Bharati, the convener. Uh, Dr. Uh, MC Patel, sir, as usual, uh, gave such an extensive talk. And uh, instead of scaring us, he usually gives us a positive outlook. And I hope I carry it on in this talk on life-saving life procedures and postpartum hemorrhage. We know that postpartum hemorrhage is defined as primary PPH if there's a loss of 500 ml. It is minor if it's 500 to 1000 ml and it becomes major when it's more than 1000 ml. It can be also moderate to severe. And whenever you have a major PPH, you have to manage it with ABC and that's A and B will be for the airway and breathing. C, C will be for the circulation. Always position the patient flat. Keep her warm as much as possible using appropriate available measures. 
transfuse blood as soon as possible when you have PPH, if it's clinically required. Until the time blood is available, at least give her warmed isotonic crystalloid, at least two liters initially, but totally can go up to 3.5 liters of warmed clear fluids. Do not use a special blood filters. You, but assuming that you're going to give blood, do not put those blood uh, IV sets. It's better if you go, go for the bigger cannula so that you have a rapid infusion of the patient. But whenever a medical method fails, particularly in atonic PPH, always resort to surgical methods earlier. And in trauma, remember that exploration is always mandatory. Do not assume that the trauma is going to go off. And always use ultrasound to aid the diagnosis when you're managing a PPH patient. The first measure, which is a surgical measure to treat PPH after your uterotonics, is the tamponade. It is very useful for atonic PPH. It can be useful after a vaginal or a cesarean birth. The intrauterine balloon, which you put inside, which can be different types of balloons depending on the region where you come from. You put the balloon until the bleeding is controlled. But remember, if there's an excessive bleeding, even after you put the tamponade, that means it's not effective whatever you've done. Then the surgical methods come. And for atonic PPH, you've got three surgical methods. One is a compression suture. Second is a stepwise devascularization. And third is hysterectomy. Compression sutures are quite quick to do, effective, and safe in atonic PPH. They've got different types of sutures, B. Lynch, Heyman's, Chose and the sandwich technique. B. Lynch is the most common technique used for uterine compression. But remember that there are procedure related complications such as uterine necrosis, erosion, and pyometra, but they're quite rare. But there's a limited follow up which showed that there are no adverse effects on fertility or future pregnancy outcomes. And if it will not control hemorrhage with your compression sutures when you're having a placenta creta spectrum, do not assume that you can save the uterus in a pass. And it will not prevent PPH in future pregnancies just because you have put a compression suture in one PPH uh, when it happened in a pregnancy. The B. Lynch suture needs to be done with a large suture because you need to avoid breaking of the suture. And also the suture should have a rapid absorption capacity because it's important that you prevent a herniation of the bowel through a suture loop after the uterus is involuted in the postpartum period. You, and we are all familiar with the B. Lynch suture and always uh, put it uh, from the anterior to the posterior wall. But one disadvantage is you will need a hysterotomy incision to uh, you do the suturing. But the other com compression suture technique like the Heyman suture can be done without a hysterotomy. That is without an incision on the uterus. When you have a vaginal birth, this is the suture to be done because you need not open the uterus for this. This is uh, the placement of two to four vertical compression sutures from the anterior to posterior wall and you tie it on the top. And this, that you can also put a transverse cervical isthmic suture in Heyman's where it is needed to, when you need to control bleeding from the lower uterine segment. So there's a modification here that is instead of doing B Lynch, you can do Heyman's uh, for the fundus and you can do it for the lower uterine segment also. The third modification is the Pereira's modification here. A series of transverse and longitudinal sutures of a delayed absorbable suture is taken and you take a series of bites into the subserosal myometrium here. Of course, if you take a suture through the myometrium, but it should be in the subserosal area, do not enter the uterine cavity. You can put two or three rows of these sutures in each direction to completely envelop and compress the uterus. And the longitudinal sutures begin and end, and the beginning and the end is tied to the transverse suture, which is nearest to the cervix. This, the, to this suture, you will tie the longitudinal sutures. And remember to always compress the myometrium man manually prior to tying down the sutures to facilitate the maximum compression. Do not tie it, uh, tie it on a loose uterine uh, surface. The fourth modification is the Cho Soak square sutures, where you put square sutures over the whole body of the uterus using a straight 10 centimeter needle. It's very useful in placenta previa. They can compress the vessels. There's something called a uterine sandwich technique where you combine a B lynch with a balloon. That is, you insert the B lynch suture, but do not tie it. Then you insert the balloon and fill it with 100 ml of fluid. Close the uterine incision, taking care and not to burst the balloon. And the B lynch suture should then be tied off after you fill the balloon. Uh, uh, you check for further bleeding because you combine both B lynch and balloon here. The next uh, type of surgery is a stepwise uterine devascularization. Here, you do a successive ligation of one uterine artery, both uterine arteries, then the lower, uh, uh, lower uh, that is the uterine artery which goes down to the cervical region, one ovarian artery, both ovarian arteries. This is stepwise, you ligate each of these arteries. And they have said in one uh, study where they studied 103 patients with intractable PPH not responding to medical ma management, 
It was effective in all those patients without the need for a hysterectomy, leading some clinicians to propose that stepwise uterine devascularization should be the first line conservative surgical treatment to control PVH. So do not hesitate to do devascularization if your atonic PVH is not getting control with your drugs. What about the combination of compression sutures and, com and uh, devascularization? There was one systematic review which concluded that compression sutures per se will have a low complication rate, but when you combine it with devascularization, there's a higher risk of uterine ischemia when you combine both. But there's a good combination method of, uh, as I said before, B-Lin suturing with balloon tamponade, which is much better compared to uh, combining a compression suture with devascularization where you may have more of ischemia. In traumatic PPH, you have to always evaluate the source of bleeding before you proceed with management. And remember to check the hemodynamic status of the person. If she's hemodynamically unstable, you have to use a temporary measure to reduce the bleeding before differential surgery and can be done only with aortic compression. But if the patient is hemodynamically stable, a uterine blood flow blockage is, um, is almost enough. And when you're doing a laparotomy to evaluate the source of bleeding, what is evident is atony. Retained placental fragments will be evident. Uterine lacerations can be seen. Suppose it's a bleed from the uterine incision, you will know. But you have to remember what is not apparent is you have to check and then only can find out like where the bleeding is. And suppose it's from inside the uterine cavity after the vaginal birth or after closure of the uterine incision, you may need to open up the cavity again to find out for a bleeding source. And if it's a retroperitoneal bleed, you have to search for it. And it can include vaginal and vulva hematomas from trauma to branches of pudendal or uterine arteries and veins and can even be due to a rupture of the posterior uterine wall. So sometimes it may not be evident when you're opening the laparotomy and you have to search for the source. And when you have an intra-abdominal bleed without an obvious uterine rupture or a bleeding vessel, remember it may be because of a hepatic or a splenic rupture, a rupture of a visceral artery, aneurysm or a pseudoaneurysm of the vessel to search for your bleeding source. And what will you do if the patient is hemodynamically unstable? You have to always stabilize her before you do go for any surgery, because if you don't stabilize her, you're going to lose the patient on the table. And the, any option you choose should depend upon the urgency to control the bleeding, the source of the bleeding, whether it's intrauterine or extrauterine, and always it depends on the surgeon's expertise and preference. And suppose it's an imminent risk of exsanguination, the patient is extremely bad, then you need to stop the iota from uh, pumping blood and you can, that you can do with a manual aortic compression, or you can do with a balloon occlusion of the iota, or it can be a direct aortic approach when you've done a laparotomy, or can use the Dr. Paley's aortic clamp to stop the iota from pumping blood when the patient is at hemodynamically unstable. And how do you do the manual aortic compression? You compress the iota against the vertebra, a few centimeters superior to the sacral promontory. That is where the bifurcation of the common iliac arteries is there, just distal to this point. And you can you do the compression with the closed fist or the heel of a hand. Or the iota can be compressed a little above, that is just below the renal arteries. And that will minimize the collateral flow from the ovarian and inferior mesenteric arteries. Even though the compression at the bifurcation may be easier, but it may be less effective uh, than what you do below the renal arteries because there's an extensive collateral blood supply to the uterus uh, from above the bifurcation. And how do you do a balloon occlusion of the iota? You can position an aortic catheter below the renal arteries, which will stop the bleeding to allow for ongoing resuscitation and can be placed either with a percutaneous femoral approach or by introducing a balloon catheter directly into the iota in a laparotomy. Or there's something called as a percutaneous aortic balloon placement technique, which is done in trauma patients, both military and civilian and emergency department settings, where you put an endovascular balloon occlusion into the iota, and it's called Ribova. In an appropriate early operating room, the balloon can be placed with an ultrasound or with fluoroscopy. And there's a direct aortic approach where intraoperatively you place an intraiotic balloon catheter and block the iota. And that can be done with a cylinder, te cylinder technique where you put a needle followed by a guide wire over which the balloon catheter is inserted. And it's always positioned below the renal arteries in the iota and above the inferior mesenteric arteries and at above the ovarian arteries. And then the balloon is inflated. It will ensure a substantial reduction in uterine blood flow. But as far as manual compression is concerned, placing the intraiotic balloon at a lower level uh, that is just above the aortic bifurcation may not substantially reduce the uterine blood flow because as I said, there's an extensive collateral blood supply. So you may need to block the iota a little above the bifurcation that is below the renal arteries. Suppose there's no risk of exsanguination, immediate risk of exsanguination. She's bleeding, but there's no, uh, she's hemodynamically stable and there's no imminent uh, risk of exsanguination, you can block the uterine arteries and that will help you to manage a bleeding source. And for that, you can place a uterine tonicate 
or you can ligate the uterine and the uterine utero ovarian arteries or you can clamp across the utero ovarian ligaments or you can do a pelvic packing and ton tonicates this is what we have been using for a long time we take a penrose drain or urinary catheter we place it as low as possible around the lower uterine segment but without incorporating the bladder and then the two ends are pulled in opposite directions and as tight tightly tied as possible around the corpus to mechanically occlude the vascular supply and when you want to ligate the uterine and utero ovarian arteries it will decrease the uterine bleeding by reducing perfusion pressure but remember it will not be useful in uterine atony or placenta accreta spectrum but may actually decrease the blood so the blood loss while well, you can do the other interventions so ligation of the uterine artery and utero ovarian arteries may not be useful in placenta accreta because you have got lots of collaterals from uh, above the uterine arteries but it does not harm the uterus and does not appear to impact the reproductive function when you ligate the uterine and the utero ovarian arteries when you clamp across the utero ovarian ligaments you have to remember that it can occlude the uterine blood flow through the ovarian artery collaterals also but you have to remember that you are li effectively ligating the fallopian tubes and that can preclude a future conception and which may need ivf for future pregnancies and sometimes it may not completely control the bleeding from uterine atonia or placenta accreta but will actually decrease the blood loss while other interventions are being attempted there's one important technique which will help you to uh, create a tamponade pressure and stop the bleeding from uh, from small pelvic arteries and that is pelvic uh, packing it can be useful uh, it's very useful as a temporary measure in the management of broad ligament or retropetal hematomas where you're not able to identify where the bleeding source is so useful in lacerations that are difficult to repair because of the location of the friability of the tissue and suppose there's bleeding related, related to coagulopathy with the and while you're replacing coagulation factors you can do a pelvic uh, packing to stop the bleeding and it's very useful for post hysterectomy bleeding internal artery ligation is another surgical procedure which can be done for pph it uh, technically challenging it will be if you have a large uterus and suppose you have done a transverse low abdominal incision it's going to be limited exposure for internal artery ligation and suppose this is hip severe in ongoing pelvic hemorrhage or the patient's obese it's going to be difficult and it's also not useful when there are extensive collateral vessels which can happen in placenta percreta and remember that this is a reverse filling of the internal iliac arteries which can occur beyond the point of ligation via branches of the external iliac artery that is the inferior epigastric obturator deep sub deep sub circumflex iliac and the superior gluteal artery so internal iliac artery uh, iliac artery ligation may be a may not be a panacea for all your uh, heavy bleeds and regarding myometrial laceration serious hemorrhage from the uterine incision is caused by lateral extensions which we see in quite a number of cesareans which we do for obese babies and the bleeding from an hysterectomy incision can actually be controlled with a suture but uh, you need to visualize the angles of the incision before you can actually pull up the sutures because there there can be a problem of retracted vessels which you may not be able to ligate so you can actually extrude the uterus very gentle uh, gently and then adequately visualize the lateral areas of the uterus above and below the edges of the incision before you place your sutures and what about broad ligament hematoma when there's an enlarging hematoma beyond the end of the incision or the laceration the myometrium it it means that there's a retracted blood vessel which is having an ongoing bleeding and remember that the ureter is very close to the vaginal angle and the bladder reflection reflection so if you blindly place hemostatic sutures laterally to control bleeding uh, from an extension of an hysterectomy laceration or a retracted vessel it you can have lots of problems so it is done with extreme caution you have to watch out for the ureter as well as the bladder when you place the sutures and remember to identify the uh, ureter before you put sutures do not place blind sutures to catch the retracted vessels and once the hemorrhage is controlled please check for the integrity of the ureters before you close that is for the broad ligament hematoma and suppose you have got the laceration of the uterine artery or the utero uh, ovarian artery branches as one stitch when you take through the myometrium uh, uh, when you ligate the uterine vessels along with the myometrium it is called the o'leary stitch and you can do that for the utero ovarian uh, branches also it is preferable to internal artery ligation because it's much more simpler where the uterine arteries are very very much accessible to you the procedure is technically easier and there's less risk to major adjacent vessels on the ureters and ligation of the uterine arteries uh, has to be done at the lateral aspect of the lower uterine segment you place the suture as close to the cervix as possible and then back across the broad, broad ligament just lateral to the uterine vessels but suppose it's not able to stop the bleeding from the uterus then you have to have actually go for to the utero ovarian arcade and they are similarly ligated just distal to the cornua but always place your suture through the myometrium also do not just pick up the vessel take the myometrium along with that and when you do that you will be able to compress the vessels 
And for retroperitoneal bleeding, identification or isolated bleeding point in the retroperitoneum is often impossible. And it's not advisable to open the retroperitoneum or attempt dissection in a non-expanding hematoma. Just watch sometimes it can subside by itself. But if there's an expanding retroperitoneal hematoma and she's coagulopathic and hemodynamically unstable, you have to be extremely careful in managing such retroperitoneal hematomas. You have to go for a temporary procedure to stabilize the patient before you begin a retroperitoneal surgery. And topical hemostatic agents can be used to control a mild diffuse bleed from the peritoneal surfaces. And if, you find, if you're lucky enough to find a discrete retroperitoneal vessel, which is, reason, which is a reason for the hemorrhage, can be clamped and ligated. But bleeding adjacent to the uterus without clear bleeding points uh, can be managed by ligation of the uterine vessels instead of going in search of the vessels. And if retroperitoneal, it can be if your uterine artery uh, ligation or the utero ovarian artery ligation is ineffective, then probably you have to ligate the ipsilateral internal artery where you're having the retroperitoneal bleed and sometimes it will stop the bleed. But if it does not respond, you may have to go for a bilateral internal artery ligation and or pelvic packing, which may be necessary. But given the technical difficulties of safely ligating the internal artery, especially in setting of DIC and ongoing bleeding, it should be attempted by surgeons with experience in the procedure. Do not uh, try out in an emergency. Get the best person, possible person to uh, manage a, in a retroperitoneal bleed. And if you have less experience, go for key temporary measures like uh, blocking the uterine artery and if she's hemodynamically unstable, blocking the iota. And you can put pressure over the bleeding point or area and sometimes if you're lucky enough, you can stop the bleeding. And always do your simultaneous resuscitation and reversal of any coagulopathy which can start when there's a mass of PPH. Call for help from an, in, an experienced surgeon always. And if the hospital has got the capability of performing an arterial embolization, we've got a radiology department which is well managed, it can always be done. But do not remove a hemodynamically unstable patient to an interventional radiology suit, which may actually aggravate the problem. And the hysterectomy is a definitive treatment of any form of uterine bleeding. Regardless of the etiology of PPH, continued blood loss can lead to a severe coagulopathy. Always remember that you know, keeping on managing with step after step, you have to actually plan it out when the problem starts. Because you, you have to remember severe hypovolemia because of the bleed, the tissue hypoxia, the hypothermia, electrolyte abnormalities and acidosis, which can happen with maso PPH, will compromise the patient's status. And if the patient is not already at, at, at laparotomy and has developed these additional complications, remember to correct all these before you go for hysterectomy because otherwise you will lose her on the table even if you go for a hysterectomy. And remember to do an early hysterectomy for placenta creta spectrum and for uterine ruptures. Do not attempt to uh, suture the uh, ruptured areas. Sometimes we will not be able to come out uh, without complications. And when you want to do a damage control approach for persistent bleeding after you've done a hysterectomy, you may need to put a large bone drain to identify whether there's a bleeding inside. And you have to do a pelvic packing after hysterectomy to prevent further bleeding. And remember the pelvic bleeding has done has, has helped, pelvic packing has helped so many patients to be, uh, so, to be saved from mortality. And you use this umbrella pack. That is you fill a sterile plastic bag or a cloth container with gauze. Wet gauze will give it more weight and place it against the pelvic bleeders. And now put drawstrings from the pack and pull it through the vagina and attach it to a weight. And this weight will provide traction to the pack, exerts pressure against the pelvic flow. And you can also use a balloon tamponade device as an umbrella pack uh, instead of a sterile plastic bag, which can give a pelvic pressure pack after hysterectomy for PPH. And you can apply hemostatic agents directly to the bleeding tissue or, or include in the pack, pads which are included in the pelvic pack for a pelvic tamponade. And in spite of packs, if she's continuous bleeding, and that means you're using more than two units packed RBCs per hour for the previous three hours, that means there's a significant ongoing bleeding. She may be need to return to the operating room or you may need to go to an arterial embolization by the interventional vascular specialist. And when to remove the pelvic pack should not be removed until the coagulation defects have been corrected, which has happened because of PPH. And if the packing has controlled bleeding, it has to be removed only after 48 hours, but do not remove it too late after 72 hours because it can cause pelvic infection or abscess. You have to remove the pack under general anesthesia where the wound is open and the gauze is removed with gentle traction. The pelvis is then irrigated with saline to clear the loose cloths and other debris, but Please do not go for an aggressive exploration of the pelvis after the bleeding is stopped. If you do not notice any pooling of blood, the wound is then reapproximated in the usual way. And role of embolization, that is at laparotomy, when you have got persistent, non-life-threatening, deep pelvic bleeding, but the patient is hemodynamically stable, you can shift her to the 
uh, radiology suit and control with uh, embolization. But if it will be very ideal if you have a facility where you've got a hybrid operating theater, where you've got a CM and a carbon fiber table along with your operation theater table. And suppose you suspect uh, bleeding after you've done a laparotomy, you've done a hysterectomy, that is a patient who's hemodynamically stable can be managed in the interventional radiology suit, but do not shift hemodynamically unstable patients from the operation theater to the radiology suit. And you can attempt embolization if you have, there's a failed surgical arterial ligation which you've done surgically. And hemodynamically unstable patients should be evaluated in the operating room, do not shift them to the interventional radiology suit. And if the facility has got an appropriate hybrid theater, that will be the best uh, possible management for severe PPH. And the laparotomy is performed, the patient deteriorates after an embolization. So do not think that embolization will be the end point for some PPH patients. And embolization can reduce bleeding before and during hysterectomy or while conservative management is being planned for placenta creta. And you can do that with a direct arterial puncture of the internal iliac artery and embolize at cesarean birth in placenta creta. That is after you deliver the baby, you can directly puncture the internal iliac artery and put a balloon there and stop the bleeding. And they have said that it's very successful in most of the cases and no complications occurred. The take home messages for this talk will be if pharmacologicals fail to control the hemorrhage, that is, if your drugs do not work, go for, go for surgical intervention sooner rather than later. And for you, the first line surgical intervention where uterine atone is a cause will be intrauterine balloon tamponade. And conservative surgical interventions like uh, devascularization and compression sutures will be the second line. But if she's hemodynamically unstable, always compress the iota before you go for definitive sterile surgery. If she's a stable patient, go for uterinary clamping, and that will help you to speed up the surgery. And resort to hysterectomy sooner rather than later, especially in case of placenta creta uh, uterine rupture. Thank you so much for a patient here. Bharati. Excellent talk. Charmila, in 10 minutes, you have taught everything about how to manage PPH. I mean, I really admire you. Thank you. All the take home messages given by you. <laughs> yes, Bharati. So, I think uh, it's a very uh, informative session all over. And um, every word was useful. And uh, uh, this is our. Uh, day-to-day uh, -day practice and that is the main our uh, clinical work so thank you dr lakshmi madam that you have allowed me to organize this webinar and uh, a good number of doctors and many pgs they have attended it so i think it's very useful and uh, thank you dr shamila dr mc patel sir dr supriya i can see and, um, and dr arup sir uh, Dr. Mandakini may couldn't see I, but probably won't hear I. And um, all panelists, and uh, of course our smiling Lakshmi Madam, as she doesn't not only organize but she gave beautiful lecture also. So Dr. Chamila, smile karo. Itna acha lecture tha, but thank you. So sara parte parte, lekin jab hum log case mein fasne hain, to bhi to do do din aur do do raat nikal jati hain. <laughs> so thank you very much yeah madam dr lakshmi ma'am you want to... i'm so happy that you covered everything i mean uh, collapse may abcd of uh, cpr then litigations which is our main concern i mean of course our main concern is to save the life of the mother but then as i was saying in my talk the, you have to save mother the baby and yourself so you covered all the three aspects, Bharti, in this webinar, jab koi baat bigad jai. So I'm sure all the delegates must have learned and they must have been benefited by today's Chaichipe Charcha, uh, by all the topics. And definitely when ma'am we discuss in such group and we talk and we learn, so we definitely get more confidence. Whenever we manage the patient, we definitely have more confidence. So thank you very much. And I think now we should leave. Yes. Say, yes. And I am ready to welcome all of you at my ISOPAR merit. So I am eagerly waiting for all of you. Yeah. Yes. Thank you, Alka. Thank you. Okay. So see you all. Nitali, you can stop recording. You can yes, recording also. See you all. Thank you so much for your appreciation. Bye. See you Bye. all next month for next uh, Chai Pe Charcha. Okay. Bye, ma'am.